here. My desktop. <laughs> Sounds like Mr. Barba singing. It is. No, that's, uh, if, it, if it was on key, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I plead the fifth. Uh, I drink the fifth, personally, but that's all right. <laughs> well, that would lead to some good singing. Mm, or you just simply don't mind the bad singing. <laughs> that's true. My, Tone down. My, my uh, deceased Uncle Jack used to say, two pints makes one cavort. I don't think about it. Be the old, it's like the old Tom Waits song, the piano has been drinking, not me. <laughs> Honestly, Ossifer, I'm not as thick as you drunk I am. <laughs> Oh my gosh, the sun's coming out here in Prior Lake. What's that? I haven't seen it in a couple of days. We had some UFOs here in Denver, actually in Breckenridge, 30 miles away from me yesterday. Really? Yeah, and the, the cops were watching it, so it's not like it was something that was made up. It was real. A real un unidentified flying object? Three of them. Wow. During the day. Huh. Well, that's a kick in the trousers. Yeah. What was the, they never uh, did figure out what it was? Well, that's why they remain unidentified flying objects, I suppose. Well, they um, obviously couldn't identify them. Yeah. But they said that there was three very bright lights, and you had to look really hard to see them. But that... Uh, it was kind of an interesting day. All the cops were pointing it out to the local yokels, and TV camera guys were up there taking pictures of it, and nobody has any idea what it was. I think the invasion has begun. Well, you know, they're spreading Ebola all through Texas. I think that's what's going on. It could be. Mm -hmm. they're, or they're here to eradicate it, one or the other. True, true. Maybe, maybe they feed on flesh-eating viruses. We don't know that. Could be, or if it's like the War of the Worlds, that flesh-eating virus could be the salvation of mankind when Mars does in fact invade. They didn't already. This is yeah. This is the no. It, it would depend. I, I, with all the with all the guys doing forced air out there, I think they may have. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't forget that guy does sheet metal work too. <laughs> You know, but with, with, with a little help and a lot of effort on all of our parts, we can save him. Well, it actually would be a good week for me to start a life of crime because during the installation of a Roth oil tank, while we were taking it down the steps, I managed to remove my fingerprint off of one of my fingers. Hey, there you go. Ouch, that must have hurt. You know, it actually didn't. The deeper the cut, the less the pain. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I've got, blood, a, I can imagine. I got, I got a V, a V-shaped slice on one of my knuckles. I can't, it's been, oh, here it is. Yeah, my, my, the middle finger of my left hand is a big old V-slate, V-shaped slice from sheet metal. Hey, that's ten times to, quick. Uh, no, I can't even say it one time <laughs> slow. <laughs> I tried to push a big eighty gallon, one of those big stone lined eighty gallon electric water heaters. I was trying right. to get it. It's like a twenty five inch wide or 30 inch water heater I'm trying to get it through a 29 inch door and it kind of slipped and my knuckle hit the open end of the of the duct work and I got to see what the bone inside looked like it was actually kind of yeah. cool <laughs> been there seen that don't want to see it again no but slap some duct tape on it and finish the job right that's right that's what we do <laughs> so they made duct tape paper towels and Bubble gum and bailing wire. Get back to work. Yeah. Can you guys see my full screen? I can hey. see your full screen, yes. Groovy. Once pulled a uh, stone line, 80 gallon stone line water heater out of a basement with a truck, thinking that it would come flying up out of the basement while riding the stairway. <laughs> I can 
<laughs> see where this is going. It brought the stairway. It, it came out of the basement, all right, but it also oh. brought the stairway with it. How much did that cost? <laughs> that was a, that was a bit embarrassing. I uh, was borrowing a power dolly from one of my wholesale suppliers one time, and my partner was late showing up to help me get a 120-gallon stone mine tank out of the basement. So I strapped it onto the power dolly, and it was one of those um, knuckle type where the knuckles right up, and then it rides on a belt and goes up to the next stair tread and pulls itself up. Mm -hmm. And I got it halfway up and went to engage the next stair tread, and it sheared it off. And so me and this 1,000-pound storage tank took a real quick ride to the basement. <laughs> Peeled his Berber Carper off of his stairs, busted every tread from the middle of the stair all the way to the bottom. We didn't make any money on that job. Yeah. Good thing your partner wasn't there. He'd probably be dead. That's mm -hmm. true. That's very true because he would have been below me, and I'm and, uh, thankful that he wasn't there at that point in time. I was kind of frustrated that he wasn't, but after that accident <laughs> happened, it's like, I'm glad you weren't here. <laughs> All right, well, it is burning the steam boiler that way. It is. And for a ride down the steps all by itself because the bull rope that we were trying to hold it back with broke and went through the doorway in the basement, which had about a half an inch to spare on either side of that boiler, slid across the floor about 15 feet and stood upright with the hand truck still attached to it, not a scratch on it. <laughs> Where's the video camera when you need it? <laughs> Well, I'm saying 10 after, uh, actually a couple of minutes after on my phone here, I think, if I can reach it. Call the one Eastern time. All right, let's get this puppy started. Good morning, RPA, all across America. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to the um, Every Other Saturday Boiler Talk, which is currently its name. As you can see from the screen, this is the Radiant Professionals Alliance. I'm speaking with our co-host, Dave Yates, and I'll give you some real quick rules of the road. Uh, please use headphones with boom mics if possible. If not, then please mute your mic to avoid any feedback and, and uh, give us background noises. Enter typing into the, any questions into the typing chat box and uh, put them attention me. I will be your host for my APMO. And any questions regarding the presentation, will be responded to after the presentation unless it's really, really important and you really, really need an answer right then and you feel it's relevant, send it to me and I'll try to stop our guest speaker to uh, see if he can answer the question at that point in time. Otherwise, hold him until the end. We will have an open Q&A following the formal presentation. And I would like to thank you all for attending. Mr. Yates. Hey, good morning and welcome. Yeah, I'm not too sure we can stump John with questions, because even if he doesn't know the answer, he'll make one up. <laughs> oh, no, he won't. <laughs> he'll he'll, defer, to the he'll defer to the time. experts. <laughs> There's a room full of experts that. here. Someone's going to have to know the answer. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Next slide, Mark. The, the fundamentals of radiant design course, let's back up on that we're teaching online, it includes some field trips where we go beyond the pages so, so that the the uh, classroom attendees don't get too bored with looking at all the formulas and what have you that's in the fundamentals of radiant design. So during the Ford online classes, we venture off of those pages, pages for several field trips. This sometimes includes videos of site installations, and on this field trip, and the other ones too for that matter, we concentrate on why doing the math, that is the heat loss and heat gain calculations, and then using that to determine what the heat emitter's hottest water temperature must be on a design day, provides the knowledge required for total system-wide energy conservation potential, or ECP. Go ahead and click, John, or Mark. Call me anything you want, Dave. That's right, just not late for dinner. That's right. The challenge on this job was that the owner insisted on keeping oil as their fuel, they did not have natural gas available, and they did not want propane. When I mentioned heat pumps, specifically the inverter series heat pumps, that was a big absolutely not under any circumstances. We hate them. So what I try to explain to the students in the class is that when you go out on a call like this, you need to ask questions. And during that question interview period, I discovered that the owners had installed all new windows and doors sealed all the air leaks that they could find, and they had added three feet 
of ATICAT insulation in the attic, which took them up to something like an R80. So needless to say, this boiler was oversized, and it was actually from the start, because when I did my manual day, I went back and did it as the house had been, and then again as the house was when I visited there, and the boiler was more than 300% oversized. Oh, no, just only 300%? Yeah, actually, could have been more than that. I'm not sure. But they were burning through more than 900 gallons of oil each year. So go ahead and click, Mark. And this is what we ended up installing for them. So with the new U.S. boiler MPO with outdoor reset and a couple of other bells and whistles, the indirect, the oil consumption was reduced to less than 275 gallons per year. But... ECB or energy conservation has another side that goes ignored far too often by installers and designers, <clears throat> and it's one that uh, I encourage the students to use to enhance their close rate or to help sell jobs, even if they have a higher price, and it works very well for me. But if you look to the top right, you can see what the other side of energy conservation looks like, and we'll get a close-up. Go ahead and click, Mark. And there we are with the Takeo Bumblebee. ECM, or Electrically Commutated Motor Circulator, and we paired that up with two of the low-watt Century Zone valves, and we programmed in a 40-degree delta T, which is what I was doing right at that moment, to ensure that the Bumblebee would run at its lowest 9-watt speed. Go ahead and click, Mark. So, oil to oil. Go ahead and click. So we had the changes that we found out from the homeowners with the added to insulation windows and doors. Go ahead and click. And Emmanuel J. revealed that the boiler was grossly oversized. And because we applied that on a room-by-room -room basis, we were able to determine that the baseboard was also grossly oversized. Go ahead and click, Mark. Which allowed us to use a much lower water temperature. And with baseboard, you can drop, it was slant pin fine line 30. So we could drop that down to 100 degrees using the outdoor reset curve. So the old boiler was a 78% efficiency, and the new boiler was 88.9 using our Testo combustion analyzer. Go ahead and click, Mark. So the new boiler had outdoor reset, which helped to trim fuel usage even a little bit further. And go ahead and click, Mark. So the old boiler had a domestic hot water coil, ran 24-7, 365. Ouch. And since boilers are not well insulated, that was a pretty hot room even during the summertime. New boiler, which is heat on demand only and the indirect. And go ahead and click mark. And now we brought the other side of ECB into play with the ECM Takeo Bumblebee Circulator and two one watt Takeo zone valves. So we were at 11 watts versus 174 watts previously. And one of the things that's required during the course is that we create homework assignments for the students. So the students at this point are tasked with the calculation for the first year energy conservation value with 2,250 2, run hours at 11 cents per kilowatt hour, which is the comparison between the old 174 watt and the new 11 watt power consumption. And that works out to 4307 with the old, uh, the old system and $2.72 with the new system for an ECB of $40.34. They then are required to project that out over a 20-year time period for the long-term energy conservation value while using a 3.5% per year increase for the cost of the power. And the long-term ECV comes to $1,140.87. And at that point, we kind of put to bed the argument that you can't sell ECM circulators and low wattage zone valve because of the added cost certainly proves that it's a worthwhile investment for the customers. Go ahead and click, Mark. So, more than 70% reduction for both the fossil fuel and the electrical usage. It's a win-win job for everybody. Uh, we get to sell a higher price job, therefore we get to make more money. And the homeowner gets to keep more of their hard-earned money rather than give it to the fuel oil company and the electric company. And that is the ending for that happy story. So, back to you, Mark. Well, thank you, Dave. I would um, encourage people to go to the Radiant Professionals Alliance University website, which is uh, basically available through HeatSpring. If you go to the heatspring.com 
you can click down to their menu and see the courses that we're offering. And this is a class that Dave puts on. And I can tell you from personal experience that Dave has gone above and beyond that uh, I've had people approach me and say, well, I'm thinking about taking somebody else's class versus Dave's. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, Dave brings years of experience with him to this class that a lot of the other instructors just don't have. A lot of them are theoreticians that have seen it on paper and they've been in the field and seen some work, but Dave is hands-on. And that makes all the difference in the world when it comes to having a good instructor be able to tell you what it is that you're looking at and what you're supposed to do with it. So. Thank you, Dave, and uh, as I said, anybody that is interested should absolutely go check that out. Thanks, There's a Mark. picture of me, your executive director of the RPA, been a member of the organization for the last 20 years. Uh, Dave and I are both contributing editors to Contract Magazine. I would encourage you to go there and read some of our articles. been an educator for life. I'm not really sure how I got stuck with that job, but I love teaching. I'm a former expert witness and um, have since moved on and decided to spend the rest of my life helping people further the use of radiant heat through the RPA. Uh, I am a licensed master plumber, but I don't share that information with a whole lot of people because they always say, hey, come on over and play cards. And by the way, do you have one of those closet augers? Yuck. Here's <laughs> an installation of a radiant wall heater that we put in for a Habitat for Humanity over 20 years ago that was actually uh, subsidized by the National Renewables Energies Laboratory. In fact, if you go to the DOE NREL site, this picture will pop up. They were so proud of that radiant wall that they just had to paste it all over their website. I'm a big fan of alternative heating sources other than floors. I think floors have their application. However, I think we've oversold people on the concept of warm floors and have forgotten to take into consideration the delivery of radiant comfort in general. So I'm a big fan of walls and ceilings. There's a ceiling during construction in my own house that I'm in up here in Heaney, Colorado, by the way. And uh, it works quite well. I turned it on yesterday at about 8 o'clock in the morning because I could see from Denver that the cabin was down to about 58 degrees. And uh, when we got up here at about noon, it was nice and toasty warm. And uh, I've also got radiant wall panels in my other room along with uh, radiant windows. So I'm sitting in a radiant tunnel right now, surrounded by radiant. That's the reason I glow so well. Uh, here's the one commercial that we have for this whole show is to uh, get you to join the Radiant Professionals Alliance. This is an organization of the members, by the members, for the members. And we basically represent all aspects of this industry from manufacturer to the end user, including the end user. Uh, we're developing code. Our code will hopefully hit the streets in a complete intact form by the uh, end of the first quarter of 2015. We're also in the process of developing a certification that will be an ANSI recognized certification for hydronic radiant designers and installers. You can get certified for both if you'd like or just one, whatever your choice is. About the talk show real quickly, we do have a contest going on. The uh, current name of the show is Boiler Talk. Uh, we've had numerous submissions. We will have a uh, $50 gift certificate that will be given to the winner. And uh, basically, all of the panelists that we've had on the show since its beginning, which this is show number three, uh, will be basically allowed to help us choose who it is that the winner is for the name of the show. The deadline is November 7th of this year. Uh, we have every, every week, we have guests that will be coming in and being interviewed. Uh, this week, we have John Barba, along with Dave Holdorf, and I will bring them on shortly here and allow John to go through his presentation. At the end of that, we will have an open question and an answering session for the actual interviewees themselves. Any questions that you've got pertaining to their program that they've delivered, you can ask it. Um, these programs will be archived for members only beginning today. Uh, we're going to allow the first three shows to be viewed by anybody in general at the RPA website, but from here on out, if you want to gain access to it, you've got to become a member. These sessions are open to members as well as non-members. And so, as an example, Mr. Yates, if you've got a builder that you would like to invite to have him come in for maybe our drain waste heat recovery session that's coming up or something, feel free to bring them in. And the same to anybody else that's out there listening as our guests. Um, submit your guest request to me, mark.etherton at iatmo.org. We do have a limited number of seats, and priority is given to paid members first. Let's slip in the hydronic news you can use. 
We have the CIFEX West Trade Show and Conference, which will be no November 5th and 6th up in Calgary, Canada. And uh, for more information, you can see this website, the URL that's listed there. Um, John Siegenthaler will be there. Robert Bean will be there. Dan Hollihan will be there. And I will be there. I'm not actually participating other than being on the outside looking in, but it's pretty rare that you get four of the Carlson Hollihan Industry Award of Excellence mm -hmm recipients uh, in under one roof in Canada at one time. And uh, who knows, there may be five of us up there. Speaking of which, this radio talk show today is a first. This is a history-making show. This is the first time that three Carlson Hollihan Industry Award of Excellence recipients have been on a radio talk show at any one point in time. Ta-da! Wow. Another earth-shaking news. Other uh, news that you can use, the AHR Expo is January 26th to the 28th in 2015. Information is available at that website. Uh, we have hitched our wagon. The RPA wagon is now hitched to this program. We will be having our System Design Showcase Award presentation there. We will also be holding our general meeting. And uh, we have a really good educational offering of six different classes that we're putting in. And uh, they're going to be how to use hydronics to create net zero homes, um, Dave's going to hopefully be doing a presentation for us on ECV values. We're still working out the details on that. We have uh, a whole lot of different things. We're going to have a town hall discussion on the state-of-the-art Internet-based energy management and control systems, and that is really going to be an eye-opener. I remember when the RP did that about 10 years ago, and it was a very good attention-getting session then, and things have progressed significantly since then. So. By all means, if you're going to be in the Chicago area in 2015 in January, which is not the greatest place to be, but we've got a really warm spot for you, uh, come by the booth. And uh, as a, a member of the RPA, we have some special guests or some special gifts for you. Additional news that you can use: we have the RPA fall course offerings. Um, definitely, if you're interested in thinking about it, you should get in and take these classes. We've got more classes that are coming. We've got. Uh, a whole bunch of people that are really contributing a lot of really good, useful industry information that is timely and topical. So today's guest, ta-da, Mr. Barba and Dave Holdorf of TACO are our guests today. Welcome, gentlemen. Yes, welcome. Well, thank, thanks for having us on. It's, uh, it's appreciated, appreciated, and I had to get out of bed this morning anyway, so I can't think of a better reason to do this. <laughs> So how's everybody doing out there in, uh, in in Internet radio land? Wonderful. Fantastic. I'm in Heaney. I couldn't be any better. John, I'm getting ready to give you the present, presenter. Oh, no. I, I think if we were in Star Trek, you'd say, you have the con. Yeah, make Maybe it you so. the con. Make That's it so, number con. one. You are a con. <laughs> did you get it yet? But um. No, did you get the screen? <laughs> oh, the joke. I thought you meant the joke. No, I don't have the screen yet. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. I am now the presenter. You now have the ball. All right, and let me share my desktop. All right, here we go. Now, can you all see my desktop? It's dark. I'm not surprised that it's a golf course. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that is a Wolf Creek golf course in Mesquite, Nevada. Um, wow. Yeah, if you're, this is the tee box, and the green, and actually you're, you're going, on this one, no, on this one I think you're going, we're going to the left. Uh, I think, actually, yeah, we're going off to the off, left. There'd be no telling which way it was going to go. Well, there's that, there's that, yeah. <laughs> this was, this was one of those, those bucket list, oh my God, kind of golf courses, and I donated many, many golf balls to the Lost Golf Ball Fund here, so. It my uh, shot would corkscrew. You wouldn't know where it was growing. <laughs> <laughs> Probably to the right, though. There you mm. go. <laughs> All righty. Well, let me uh, get this, this this thing started. Um, and uh, I don't, it, it, is Dave unmuted as well? If we can make sure Dave's unmuted yeah. so yeah, my man Dave can chime in. Um, um, my name is John Barba, and uh, I'm the, the, the training guy for TACO. And my associate, Mr. Dave Holdorf, is the uh, also the training guy from TACO. He has the important part of the country. He has the Northeast. <laughs> they just gave me the rest of the country to kind of get me out of the way. But uh, Dave's, uh, Dave is, uh, 
But, well, Dave, why don't you give, uh, give a bit about your background? You're like a 20-year veteran, aren't you, or something like that, in, of our of our wonderful industry? Yeah, something like that. I, I, I'm starting to lose count now. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, on board with Taco now at least two and a half years uh, in the training aspect for the East Coast. And, uh, you know, before that was uh, Upanor, and then before that was Wurzbo, and before that was RGI, which was all ended up Upanor. So uh, started off with the tech support and design side of things. So where I was the guy sitting in the office getting the phone call, does this stuff really work? Would you heat your house with this? You know, not just <laughs> contractors and homeowners yep. uh, in the radiant world. So uh, very interesting way back when and, and to think where we are now. Yeah. So Holdorf, I have a question for you, a couple sure. actually. Is there any truth to the rumor that you had hair when you first started in this business? <laughs> uh, no, I did not actually. I was uh, I was really darn close to shaving back then. I just couldn't do the Vic yet, but I was buzzing it. So, uh, oh, okay. You know, there are there are pictures out there floating around where I did have long hair and a ponytail. Um, but um, I oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> all right, I'm all right, people. I'm putting a bounty, fifty bucks for anyone who can produce one. I need to see those pictures. <laughs> it probably leaked out of the cloud someplace. I'm sure we can find it. <laughs> The other rumor that I would like to put to death, Dave, is is um, is there any truth to the rumor that you actually worked for Cousin Vinny on Long Island selling rubber hose radium a long time ago? Cousin Vinny, no. Uh, no, I've met him a few times, but I never worked with him or for him. Okay, well, I'm glad we put that rumor to rest. I had a higher view of you than that, but I just knew it wasn't true. No, no, <laughs> but I remember Vinny. He would, he would stop by the office every once in a blue moon. <laughs> Dave, by the way, saved my life one time. We were at an RPA function in Chicago, and I don't know how it happened, but this is pre-9-11, and I ended up losing my wallet. And so Dave and I are walking to the airport when I realized I didn't have my wallet, and it's like I've got to get on that plane. And so I'm standing there talking to this counter agent about how I submit to a search strip, whatever it took just to get me on the airplane, and Dave walks up and slaps the counter, and he says, the guy's legitimate, let him go, and walked away, and this guy said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I saved Dave's name in, in Las Vegas this spring. Yes. We walked into a function, and Dave and his wife are sitting next to me, and I looked down on the floor, and there's Dave's name tag laying on the floor. So I saved his name. I paid him back for saving my life. There you go. I'm just surprised they took Dave's word for it, that you were okay. It was forceful. It was, you know, you know how... How shiny his head is. He walked up that guy and looked him in the eye and slapped his hand on the counter and says, he's legitimate. Let him on. Said, okay. <laughs> yeah, probably thought he was Kojak. <laughs> Could have been. Thought he was an undercover TA sage or something. But no, Dave, Dave's definitely not the guy you want to cross. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us, Mr. Holdorf, and say hello to your lovely wife. My pleasure. Thank you. I will. And uh, just so everybody knows, they, they celebrated an anniversary uh, two days ago, Correct. Dave and Mary Beth, and is it 15 years, Dave? 15 years, yes. Congratulations. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. The first four were happy. <laughs> <laughs> then I started traveling. Uh, <laughs> I think so okay, then. Uh, we'll see if we make 16. All right. <laughs> um, well, let's get this show started. Uh, we, I, uh, tell us about yourself, Mr. Barber. You've got a long, sorted history in this industry. Uh, well, I have a, I have a sorted history. Long, I don't know about. But um, no, I, I, like, like everybody else out here, I started out as a child. And um, uh, the old man put, put a wrench in my hand when I was about four, uh, told me to go fetch stuff, basically told me to go look for things that really didn't exist. So I'd just kind of get out of the get out of the basement and <laughs> let him get his work done. Um, it was the time he told me to go mix some spotted paint that I realized I think he, he didn't have a lot of faith in my technical abilities. <laughs> um, now, I grew up in a family plumbing and heating business, uh, worked all through high school, like, again, like most of the folks who are here, I'm sure. Um, I dabbled in, in radio news and disc jockeying for a while, then went back to, to a real job. And um, strange twists and turns put me uh, on this side of the computer as we as we speak. So. Uh, between Dave and I, I think in the past three years, Dave, we've probably been in front of, uh, I'd say at least three, 4,000 customers, contractors, wholesalers, reps. Would that be a fair statement, Dave, you think? At least, maybe 5,000? Yeah, I would say that. I know yeah, we, myself, at least, uh, 
about 2,000 people myself over the last, yeah, 1,500 over the last couple of uh, years, yeah. Yeah, I mean, between online stuff, we do webinars, uh, our face-to-face -face training with Takeo and our factory classes, et cetera. Um, that, that, that's probably a, a reasonable number. Um, and, I, and we've been fortunate enough to be able to share what we have learned along the way uh, that we picked up. In, in, in Between Dave and I, we, you know, we kind of learn every day. We learn as much in our classes as anybody else. You know, so we share what we know. They share what they know. We collect what they know, add it to what we know, and then, you know, People think we know what we're talking about, so that's kind of how it works. Um, and it, it's always interesting that when we, in our in our day long classes or in any any of the programs we do, when the, when the issue of variable speed pumping comes up, because it's a buzzword in our industry, everybody talks about it, everybody kind of gets the big picture to a degree, but but the theory and application uh, tends to be where a, a, a level of of comfort st t starts to go away. I mean, they know the pumps vary their speed. They know to a degree it may save some electricity. Most folks really don't quite understand exactly how much electricity it does save. And they, and more importantly, what other impacts uh, variable speed pumping have on the overall performance of the system and, 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 and what benefits they have. They just think it's, it's new, it's improved, it's the latest and greatest. And people tell me it saves energy, so so here's what here's where we go. So we put together this presentation, Dave and I, on on um, you know theory and application, and why I would use one of the, one of these things, and and with a specific discussion towards um, the Takeo offering of, uh, of of the bumblebee uh, and its future offspring, which variable speed uh, based on a, a delta t. We use the delta t in the system to as the outside input to vary the speed for the simple reason that for the types of systems we install here in North America, the, um, you know, the, the, your zone, whether it's a B zone pumping or, you know, on off zone valves, um, Delta T is, it tends to be the preferred choice and the one that brings the most benefits to the table. And we'll discuss that as, as we go along. Um, so when we think about why using, why use variable speed circulator, um, I like to just throw some numbers out at you, comparing the market here in North America, the U.S. and Canada, compared to, to the market in Europe. Because I think also as an industry, we have a tendency to look to Europe as, as the as the ones that know what they're doing. They're better at this than we are. They know everything. Um, the Europeans do some amazing stuff. Most of it's mandated by law, uh, and, that, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But there, there's some there's some cool stuff there. But we got to put everything into perspective. First number, just to share with you, is the residential hydronics market share. Throughout Europe, it's in the 90 to 95 percent range residentially. Here in the U.S., the residential market for for you know forced hot water. I'll take steam out of the picture because steam's kind of there, there's a lot of steam houses in the Northeast, but they're 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 becoming fewer and farther between. I'm going to guess it's about six to seven percent. Um, I'm not sure if that number's high, low. Uh, it feels right. Um, I've heard numbers as high as 12. I've heard numbers as low as three. Uh, so I have six, seven. That sounds about right uh, for the overall market share. Um, and, and it's dwindling because most of the new construction, if there is any left, is going on in the warm weather belt where the cooling load is much, much more important than the heating load. And if it's tracked housing, it tends to be, you know, the, the, the basic simple forced air slash air conditioning system that tends to be put in most homes. Uh, Right, wrong, or indifferent, that's just the reality of the situation. Uh, this is kind of some inside information. Annual circulator sales estimated. Uh, in Europe, they'll sell an estimated 13 million circulators a year, everything from you know, the smallest residential circulator to their largest residential circulator. This is residential circulators only. We're not talking commercial pumps, industrial pumps, or anything like that. We're talking you know, basically the double O series, if you're familiar with Takeo, the double O series about 13 million a year. Uh, here in the U.S., it's about one, one and a half million circulators a year. Again, estimated, taking everybody's information that gets, that, that, that's been submitted to the Department of Energy, um, about one and a half million circulators per year. And that's the, that, that tends to start to put things into perspective just a little bit. Kilowatt uh, hour rate, these are averages. Throughout continental Europe, they're looking at about 35 cents a kilowatt hour, the equivalent of 35 cents a kilowatt hour. Here in the U.S., we're at about 11 cents a kilowatt hour on average. Now, it's dragged down. You get places like uh, Wash, you know, uh, 
Washington State, where they have a lot of hydroelectric, uh, you know, in the eastern part of Washington State, they may be at four or five cents a kilowatt hour. You get up into other areas up in the northeast, maybe you're at 20, 22 cents a kilowatt hour. I live in Minnesota. We're right at Minnesota is about as an average of a place as you can find on the planet. We're right at 11 cents a kilowatt hour. So um, it, it just, it's a range. Okay, it's just a range of being a little bit all over the place. So just to, some numbers to get us started to look at things into pers look at these things into perspective. Some more numbers when we're comparing wattage um, again with forced air and with with hydronics. Uh, a typical wes residential wet water circulator. <laughs> Um, try saying it goes back that five times fast. I can't say it one time slow. Sound like that guy on uh, the, the 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 Big Bang Theory. A residential wet water circulator power consumption, <laughs> eighty watts. That's a double oh seven. Is eighty watts. Um, you know they're all in the same ballpark. You know fit anywhere between sixty five and eighty five, eighty watts. It's it's all it's all kind of pretty much the same game for your typical permanent split capacitor capacitor wet rotor circulator. Now in a zone valve application, at one pump can do 100,000 BTUs, you know, can do 10, 10 gallons a minute, all right? It can do 8, eight, eight gallons a minute, 80,000 BTUs, depending upon the load of the house. Compare that to, a, to the average uh, furnace blower motor power consumption. You move in the same amount, of, same amount of BTUs with anywhere from 600 to 1,000 watts. I mean, again, even the variable speed, even a variable speed uh, motor uh, might bring that down to 300 to 600 watts. So, you know, we're talking about a hell of a lot more wattage to move the same amount of 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 energy, the same amount of heat, uh, and we're not even talking, you know, fancy smancy high efficiency yet. All right. Uh, so, it, it's, those are just numbers to put into perspective as well. Uh, in Europe, this is this is your typical European heating system. Okay, panel radiators. Uh, with thermostatic radiator valves, home runs to each radiator, okay? And the TRV kind of monitors and adjusts and sets the comfort level uh, in each room as best it can. And, and this is a system that's been used in Europe since they started installing central heating systems in residential applications in the late 60s, simply because it was the easiest thing and the least expensive thing for them to stick in at the time. Uh, they, they, you know, the development of PEX made this relatively simple. You could run a four, you could run 14 millimeter or 3 8 inch PEX uh, supply and returns to each room in really, really old houses, which is what they had back then. Uh, to install a central heating system and get rid of the get rid of the you know the coal stove, um, so that was just the simplest, easiest, most straightforward type of installation they had, and that's why it became the industry standard over there because it's what they did traditionally. So it's thermostatic radiator valves primarily. Very few thermostats installed in Europe. Although doing a little bit of research uh, this morning, and Dave, I think you have something to, to add to this is. Um, the the Nest is is now being brought over to Europe. The Nest thermostat, as well as others, uh, they're starting to see the uh, advantage of actually turning the system down or turning the system off when you don't need any heat. So actually, thermostats, as I understand it, and Dave, please share if you have any information as well, are starting to become a little bit more noticed in Europe. Would that would that be a fair statement? Um, yeah. After uh, last couple of trade shows that I've had uh, with some European manufacturers, they've been seeing. Uh, an influx of thermostats being installed in homes now. Yeah, you'll see. I think mostly you'll see thermostats installed in Europe with radiant floor heating systems and manifold actuators, where they'll have a bunch of zones on one room uh, or a bunch of zones on one manifold. Uh, manifold actuators and thermostats are fairly common in floor heating situations, but I think what we're now starting to see, as Dave said, is, is more thermostats being installed in in uh, this type of an application as well, where maybe. The main living area will not have a have a have a TRV at all. It'll simply be run by a thermostat that turns the system on and off, turns the pump on and off, and then your uh, pan, the, the the panel radiators with TRVs are kind of like subzones. And I think you're going to see that as an energy savings uh, approach start to become uh, more common because after all, the most efficient boiler, the most efficient pump, the most efficient system is the one that's off. It doesn't use any fuel then. Okay. Uh, typically, without thermostats, uh, circulators over there will run 24-7. They'll run continuously, um, prompting the need for uh, a, a pressure differential bypass valve if it's a, if it's a fixed speed pump, or the development of variable speed technology that can run really very, very slowly. Um, the European standard for rating 
the efficiency of variable speed ECM circulators in Europe has a baseline of 6,000 hours worth of operation. Now 6,000 hours, let me whoop out my calculator here real quick. 6,000 hours, get the iPhone out, 6,000 hours divided by 24 hours, that's 250 days divided by 30 days per month, that's 8.33 months, okay? That's turning the pump on, basically that's turning the pump on on Labor Day and turning it off on Memorial Day. Um, in Europe, that's known as the beginning of September and the end of May, by the way. Uh, but that's what the European standard, if you see the ABCD ratings on circulators, the European standard is based upon 6,000 hours of operation. So the pump runs all the time, giving an overall large amount of flow to the system. The TRVs will actually modulate to control flow through your individual radiators. Now, here in the U.S., our typical American system, and I put a question mark on after that because I'm not sure there is a typical American system anymore. Uh, our hydronics have become a lot like our culture, kind of a real melting pot. Um, you know, the, the, in, in the Northeast, the most common, and, and perhaps in much of the country, the most common type of heating system is a series loop thin two baseboard type of heating system. I grew up in a house that had, actually I grew up in a house that had uh, cast iron radiators in a two pipe system, but then after that lived in a house with uh, two zones of series thin loop base, uh, thin two baseboard. So, um, that's kind of your typical uh, uh, system, but you might. But there are also a lot of systems with cast iron baseboard, cast iron radiators on two pipe systems or venturi type of systems, convectors on two pipe or venturi type systems. Then we have an awful lot of radiant floor heating that's gone on here in the U.S. We also have hydro air uh, right behind me. If you can't really see it, but uh, right behind me is a built-in hydro air system with a boiler and an air handler for forced air heat upstairs and then tappings downstairs for hydronics for, for the lower level. We have radiant floor heating we have, and we have panel radiators on TRVs and one panel radiator that's on a thermostat. Uh, so that's it, 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 maybe the typical American system is atypical, but by and large, we do these things. With our, with our heating systems, we do have multiple zones. We either zone by circulator or we zone with a single circulator with zone valves. That tends to be, by and large, the mo most common types of heating systems installed in North America, and that's kind of beyond dispute. That's just kind of the way it really is. Uh, according to AHRI studies, our hours of operation, I mean, they, they study how, may, how, how many hours during the normal heating season in an on-off type of operation uh, the appliances may run, and that's the boiler, the circulators, things like that. These uh, approximate hours of operation range between 2,100 and 2,500 hours in the colder weather parts of the U.S. Now, here's the map from AHRI that, that kind of gives you your... Uh, your, your hours of heating season. Now, this doesn't tell you how cold it is. This just gives you the hours uh, during the heating season that something may, in fact, run. The BTU load, that's going to give you the and degree days. That'll give you the depth of the heating season. This just gives you the length, the hours. And you'll notice if you go up on the West Coast there by Seattle, you see you're at around 3,000 hours. It doesn't get all that cold out there, but it doesn't get all that warm either, okay? So you're talking about a long, uh, a long but shallow heating season. Uh, if you look uh, in the cold weather belt, let's start, if you can see my cursor, start here in Maine, go through New Hampshire, Vermont, New York, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, right there's Prior Lake, North and South Dakota, into Montana, and then we take this sharp <laughs> downward turn into Wyoming and Colorado. Uh, that's the cold weather belt, one of the cold weather belts. We're talking about 2,500 uh, 2,500 heating hours. You get a little further south, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, into New Jersey, Pennsylvania, uh, through West Virginia, Ohio, into that area you're talking, and, and you know, Virginia, that, that area, you're talking about about 2,000 hours. So on average, we're looking around between 2,100 and 2,500 hours for, for, for the cold weather belt of the United States. What does that all mean in terms of variable speed pumping? Well, I want to talk a little bit about what Dave said. And, 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 and Dave, I, I wholeheartedly agree with everything you said about uh, uh, energy savings. I, I think it's important to put it into perspective so we understand where those numbers come from and what they, in fact, do represent. So what I want to share with you is uh, what, what's the difference between zone pumping and zone valves and then zone valves and zone valves with an ECM pump in terms of, of wattage and electrical consumption? 
First off, zoning with pumps. Let's say I have a five-zone system with five Taco 007s at 80 watts each. That's 400 watts of pumping power, okay? 400 watts of pumping power to move, let's say, 80,000 BTUs, okay? Still better than seven or 8,000 watts with a forced air furnace, but it's, 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 it's 400 watts worth of pumping power. To estimate fuel saving or estimate electrical consumption, it's a pretty simple math formula, uh, divide your watts by 1,000 to get kilowatts. All right, so 400 watts is, is basically four-tenths of a kilowatt. Once I know my kilowatts, I estimate by my kilowatt hours. Now, you can look at those at the, at the, at the, the, the chart that we showed earlier, and then you can say, you know what, I, I got outdoor reset on my boiler. Maybe my pumps won't run 2,100 hours. Maybe they'll run longer. Okay, let's throw 3,000 hours at it. Maybe that's a realistic number. We'll throw 3,000 hours at it. And whatever number you throw here, throw here, whatever number you're comfortable with, put here. But 3,000 hours is, you know, that's four months of continuous operation if you want to look at it that way. So it's, it's a fairly solid number, but whatever number you feel comfortable with, you can put here, and it'll, be, it'll allow you to put all this in perspective. So 0.4 kilowatt hours times 3,000 odd hours for each circulator, say each circulator runs 3,000 hours, that's 1,200 kilowatt hours, okay? 1,200 kilowatt hours. Now, once we have the kilowatt hours, you multiply by your cost. Whatever your cost per kilowatt hour is, if it's four cents a kilowatt hour, there's your number. If it's 22 cents a kilowatt hour, there's your number. Whatever it costs you, wherever you are. Uh, the national average is 11. I'm going to use a slightly higher than national average here, 13 cents a kilowatt hour. So 1,200 kilowatt hours times 13 cents a kilowatt hour, that's $156 a heating season to operate your five pumps. That's not per pump, that's all five pumps. So each pump is a, a little over 31 bucks a, a month to operate. Oh, I'm sorry, a little over 31 bucks a year to operate. $31 a year to operate each individual circulator within these parameters, okay? So as, as far as comparisons are concerned, let's keep everything, everything here consistent. If we go with zone valves, if we were to switch from, let's say, instead of five circulators, let's go to one standard circulator and five zone valves, the zone sentry zone valves that, that Dave alluded to earlier. So it's one 007 at 80 watts, again, presuming the 007 can handle the flow and head requirements, and it's really, that's what it's designed to do. It'll definitely handle the flow requirements. In normal, you know, copper piping and all that, we're talking, you know, a max of eight, feet, eight, or eight to ten feet ahead, it should be plenty to handle that. Uh, so one 80 watt circulator, five zone sentry zone valves, that's a, that's a, a, a total of 87.2 watts of power consumption. Again, you can see where this is going. 400 watts, 87.2 watts. What we've really done is we have effectively cut our electrical consumption by 80% right here. And the magic formula is we have 80% fewer circulators. Okay, that's just the simple truth of it. 80% fewer circulators. So in this case, 87.2 watts divided by 1,000. You can see where we're going here, 0 0.0872 kilowatts times 3,000 hours. That's 262 kilowatts compared to what we had before. Again, about an 80% reduction. At 13 cents a kilowatt hour, now we're looking at $34.06 a year to run that system. And again, over a seven-month heating season, let's use October 1st to uh, April 30th, that's, uh, that's less than five bucks a month on your heating bill. So we've gone from 31 bucks a month to about five bucks a month. And we haven't even touched ECM yet. We've done a significant savings right here simply by reducing the number of pumps by 80%. Now if we add an ECM circulator to the, to the, to the, to the equation, and here we'll use, let's say it does vary its speed and we're able to run it at about 20 watts. And again, as Dave pointed out, if you, if you design intelligently, you can set that thing up so that it'll work at its lowest level for most of the, most of the time at around 9 watts. So again, a little bit of thinking ahead of time allows you to, to, to adapt to this. But let's use a higher, a, a, a mid, midway point, uh, you know, actually a low midway. The, the Bumblebee runs from 9 to 42 watts. There's a low midway of 20 watts with 1.44 watts. Uh, per zone valve. Now we're at 27.2 watts. You can, again, see where this is going. 3,000 on hours. Now we're at 82 kilowatt hours. And times 13 cents a kilowatt hour. Now we're at $10.66 a year. So you can see the progression. We've gone from 156 bucks a year, which isn't an onerous amount of money. It's, it's not saving that money is not going to change anybody's life. It's, simply, it's nice to save it. It's nice cause you, but, but what you'll do is you'll spend it on something else. But we, we, we've gone from $136 a year 
down to $35 a year, I think it was, now down to $10.66 a year. So our savings, if we compare apples to apples, I don't, I don't think it's, it's legit to compare ECM just to five circulators. You've got to compare it to one circulator and five pumps and then five pumps. That middle part really does need to be part of the equation to put it all into perspective. Now we're talking about a savings of $23.40 annually. Again, round numbers, but, but the percentages are, are, are reasonable. Uh, $23.40 a year in electrical savings. Over a seven-month heating season, we are cutting an electrical bill by up to by $3.34 a year. No, a month, rather, $3.34 a month in this scenario. Okay, your mileage may differ, but, but to me, this is a kind of a realistic way of comparing the cost of zoning with circulators, the cost of zoning with a standard circulator and zone valves, and the operation, operational cost of, of zoning with an ECM circulator and zone valves. It's kind of, of a realistic comparison between the three. So what, what usually happens a lot of times when we show people that the, the, we're, we're not talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of dollars a month or even a year that we're going to be saving going from one circulator and five zone valves to one ECM circulator and five zone valves. Usually this is the response I get in class. <laughs> they kind of look, look kind of like Homer here. Um, so if that's the the if that's what uh, an ECM circulator brings to the table in terms of variable speed, that's nice. There's and as Dave said, over tw over 20 years, that can certainly add up if you compare again the circulators, the multiple circulators to one circulator and zone valves. Uh, that can certainly add up over time. But but that's hardly an an attention getter. It's nice. It, and it's nice and it's simple. It's an easy story to tell. Uh, but if you really want to make this story compelling, we've got to bring something else to the table, too. And this is where we start to look at why paying attention to the delta T on a system can help us. Again, we're going to compare a fixed speed circulator now with zone valves, one, one standard fixed speed circulator with zone valves. And this is, a, uh, this is a, a pump curve for, let's say, your standard three-speed circulator, one of your industry standard three-speed circulators, Grunfoss 1558, the Taco 0015, you know, take your pick. They all have very similar pump curves. And these black lines going from 0, 0 on up, those represent uh, system curves, system operating curves. The one at the far right is all zones calling, okay, and the one on the far left is one zone calling, your smallest zone calling. And as we all know, systems operate where the system curve intersects the pump curve, okay, and that is true for all fixed speed circulators and, and many variable speed circulators that have, relatively speaking, fixed pump curves. The system will work where the pump curve intersects, the system, and pump curve and system curve intersect. So let's take a look at the system here. 70,000 BTUs, all right? At a 20, it's designed to a 20 degree delta T, and we're talking zone valves, spin tube, baseboard, et cetera. 70,000 BTUs, all right? At a 20 degree delta T, that comes out to seven gallons a minute, and we do our head calculations, and it comes out to five feet ahead. Well, right there, seven gallons a minute, five feet ahead, right where that little green dot is, that's our operating requirement point. Because we have a funny industry, once we slap a pump on there, the chances of the system ever working at seven gallons a minute at five feet ahead are slim and none, really, because uh, the system's going to do what the pump says. The pump is one of the, is, I think, in the, in the troika of boiler, heat emitter, and circulator, I think they are, they are all on equal, equal footing because the pump's the only thing that talks to both the boiler and the heat emitter, and the pump really has a, plays a really huge role in how effective and how comfortable and how efficient the system, or economic, rather, how economic the system is to operate. And, and maybe this might help illustrate why. Uh, so seven gallons a minute, five feet ahead, that's the requirement. But as my good friend Wes Cisco always says, this is the only industry he knows of where we measure with a micrometer, we mark with a piece of chalk, and then we cut with an ax. Okay. What we're doing right here is we've measured with a micrometer, we're marking with a piece of chalk, but the minute we slap a pump on there, we're, we're, we're cutting with an axe. The system's really going to work way the heck up there, right, where that, where that system curve intersects the pump curve at, at about 9.5 gallons a minute at about 8 feet ahead. Okay. Is it going to work? Oh, heck yeah. All right. It's absolutely going to work. We're going to deliver the BTUs. No one's going to call up and complain that they're freezing to death and it's your damn fault. All right? You're never going to get that phone call. But here's the thing. Numbers don't lie. We know that this, the universal hydronics formula states that GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times 500. Uh, that happens to be 
scale number one on the Bell and Gossett system sizer wheel. Okay, as we all, as three of us here know, we've we've held the original one of these things in our hands. That's just, that's scale one uh, on the on the system sizer wheel. GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times 500. But because it's algebra, we can kind of manipulate this and isolate for delta T. Find out, okay, based on what we know is going on, what's the delta? We can kind of predict what the delta T of the system will be on the coldest day of the year, design conditions, assuming everything is designed properly. Okay, it's theoretical, but this is maybe the best we could hope for. Okay? So delta T, in fact, can equal the BTU load divided by the gallons per minute flow rate you're providing, because now we know what the gallons per minute flow rate is that we're providing, uh, divided by 500. So we fill in the blank, 70,000 divided by 9.5. Okay, 70,000 BTUs under design conditions divided by the 9.5 gallons per minute we are pumping through the system, that, that's, the, that's the flow rate, um, divided by 500. And if we math that out, it's approximately 14 and a half degrees. So you could walk into this house on the coldest day of the year and look at your supply and return temperature gauges, if you have them, and you can say, it's 14 and a half degrees. Right? N you're never going to see 20 degrees, ever. Ever, ever, unless it gets, guess, unless you dip well below your design conditions, okay. Based on what we can, based on the the, the fixed speed stuff that we put in here, the best we're going to have is a fourteen and a half degree delta T on the coldest day of the year with all zones calling. That's the best we'll ever see. Now here's the kicker: no one's ever going to call you up and say, "Hey, buddy, you promised me a twenty degree delta T in my system. It's fourteen and a half. Get your butt out here and fix it now." You'll never hear that because the system works. You're you're, you're warm. They're, they're going to be. They're not going to be cold in the house. Now, with Obviously, one zone call, for the mechanical engineers, John, because they, they sit there and watch that all the time. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's why I like this. That's why I like doing what I do. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. You, you know, there's, a, there's an old saying about engineers, um, is that you can always tell an engineer, you just can't tell them much. <laughs> right? Yeah. And for all the engineers out there in the audience, um, uh, direct your complaints to Mark Etherton. <laughs> At Mac.com. At, yeah, at, at, at Match.com. Yeah, Mac. Oh, Mac. I thought you said Match, and I said, this is something you need to share with us. I don't know. Mm -hmm. All righty, one zone calling, 10,000 BTUs per hour. It's a, it's a small zone. One gallon a minute is the requirement at, let's say, three feet ahead, uh, or five feet ahead there, where that dot happens to be. But where it really works is going to be where that system curve intersects the pump curve at up around two gallons per minute. So now we're, we're delivering 10,000 BTUs, not with one gallon a minute, but with two gallons a minute. Again, it's going to work. Okay, it's going to work, but this is the result that we're going to encounter, and that's 10 degrees. So under design conditions, your quote-unquote coldest day of the year, let's say zero degrees is your design condition, okay, or whatever it is in your part of the world. So let's use zero degrees as a number. It, the best you're ever going to see when it's zero degrees outside Providing the house is radiated properly and the boiler's not terribly oversized, which is going to change things too. I don't know. But 10 degree, the delta T in that system is going to bop between 10 and 14 and a half. Okay, that's the best it's ever going to be. So the water may be going, if it's a cast iron boiler, the water's going out at 180 and coming back at 165 and a half at best or at 170. Okay, if that's what's going on, what's the end result? Can anybody guess? Lower delta T. That's the lower delta T. But what's going to be the end result with with our with our, with our friend at the boiler? That picture that picture's got to give it away. I have nightmares about that picture. <laughs> John John Langan has it. <laughs> what's he writing? Lower efficiency, more short cycling. He's writing a short cycle, right? <laughs> Oh, uh, gosh. Okay, I don't have a picture of Dave with long hair and a ponytail, but I do have a picture of Dave riding a, sh a short cycle, okay, just so everybody knows. <laughs> yeah, I see he's got his hair tacked up under the hat, huh? There you go. There you go. Yeah. Now, that's, that, that, just so everybody knows, that's not really Dave. Okay. You said you weren't going to share that photo. I'm <laughs> sorry. And, it, and, and this, it's not me either, okay? It's not me either. I'm, I'm a little concerned it might be Yates, though. I'm not sure. Anyway. Easy, not easy. Easy, big fella. So uh, does that make sense, though? It's, it, it, we, you can see boilers short cycle when the delta T's get small, especially cast iron boilers. And that's when it's zero, uh, zero out. At 35 degrees out, we cut that in half. Your system delta T's going to be banging back and forth between 
five and seven and a quarter. And now we got a boiler that's, you know, the, the, this short cycle. And when you short cycle a boiler, it's not as economic to operate as it could or should be. The burn may not be as efficient as it could or should be. Uh, and then you tend to have a, you tend to wear out, you know, it ra t t potentially very expensive service parts prematurely when they sh when they short cycle uh, to this extent. And we spend. Now now that, that's 50% load, but the, the crazy thing is we spend about 50% of the heating season at about one-third load or less. So these numbers get even kookier the further you get into it. So that's where the bumblebee comes in. That's why we look at delta T as a way of varying the speed of a circulator, because it really reflects the BTUs being taken out at a given point in time. It kind of reflects what's really going on with a system. Uh, as beyond just zones opening and closing, but in terms of just BTU loads in general, as we can infer a lot from that. So here's the Bumblebee's um, performance curve. Line number one down at the bottom, that's the minimum speed. It never goes slower than that. And line number two up at the top is the maximum speed. And it, what, what's going to happen is during operation, the pump's just going to vary. It's going to bop back and forth between lines one and two based on the delta T you program into it, and your sensors are on the supply and return. And they try to, they, they watch those two temperatures, and the, the, it doesn't care what the temperatures are, it only cares about the difference, and it's just going to bop back and forth to maintain that 20 degree delta T. Uh, for instance, well, let's see where this thing's going to land. Where's the bumblebee going to land with all zones calling design conditions? Well, he's going to fly around, and by golly, he's going to land right there. If you'll note, that's seven gallons a minute at five feet ahead. Again, presuming our, our calcs are dead on. It, they, they're ne they never are. They're always, our calcs are always going to be a little high. But what's going to happen is the pump's going to adjust to the reality of the system under design conditions. And what we, what we do develop here is now a new pump curve. This is the only variable speed circular where, circulator where the system curve will adjust to the, to the needs of the system. And the, and the curve itself will move to meet to adapt to the changing needs of the system. So there's your speed, your maximum speed with all zones calling under design conditions. If, we, if four of the zones close and we only have the one small zone calling, the smallest zone calling, there's the requirement, all right, and there's the other pump curve, all right? So on the coldest day of the year, as zones open and close, the, the, the pump curve is just going to bop back and forth very, very evenly and smoothly between those two lines. Okay? Now, 35 degrees outside, we're at 50% load. 50% load, we're looking at 35,000 BTUs. That's three and a half gallons per minute. If we calculate out the head, of, head loss through that system at three and a half gallons per minute, that's kind of where you'd be, you know, three and a half gallons per minute, about a foot ahead. Obviously, that's well below the minimum speed. It's not going to work there. It's actually going to work right about there where that system curve intersects the pump curve. Now, here's the kicker. Most of the heating season, again, you're not going to see a 20-degree delta T uh, if you design it to a 20-degree delta T because most of the heating season, you're going to be well below uh, your mi that minimum pump curve line. So most of the heating season is going to run at about 9 watts. You're going to have a 20-degree delta T? No. But here's the good news. You're not going to have a 5-degree delta T either. Okay, that's the good news. You're not going to have a 5-degree delta T, and we're going to help that boiler work as economically as possible, and we're going to help that system work as economically as possible. The greatest impact of this directly will be felt in cast iron boilers, okay, with nice with wide firing differentials. There will be instances where we can satisfy calls for heat without ever firing the boiler, just living off the residual heat that's in the boiler. Right? And again, if you can satisfy a call for heat without firing a boiler, well, Glorioski, Captain BTU, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, when we, in a modulating condensing boiler, uh, depending upon how it's piped, the, the, the benefit can, it, it, it ranges from okay to, 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 to fairly significant, particularly if you, if you use a buffer tank. The, the more, the more, it gets more significant when you use a buffer tank in, conduct, in conjunction with your modulating condensing boiler, which is a really good idea to do. Uh, buffer tanks help short cycling with ModCon boilers anyway. Add a variable speed delta T circulator on the del heating system delivery side. Now we can squeeze every last ounce of efficiency out of that sucker as possible. And, that, and, that, and that's a happy thing.
So again, why why do we look at delta t? It's simple. It's arithmetic. Okay, arithmetic kind of kind of kind of states it. It's a it's a fit when when you have a, a a fixed delta t, but the load varies as the load will vary both with the weather and with the number of zones opening and closing. Well, if the delta t remains fi relatively fixed, or a circulator tries to keep that delta that delta t fixed, the flow has to vary with it uh, and give you the right amount of flow and. It conversely, the, the lower the flow when it's warmer out or when, it's, when, it's, um, uh, when zones are closed, we're going to run more and more often towards that lowest power consumption and use, use considerably less electricity there. And then lower boiler return temps, not temos, but temps, uh, that certainly helps as well with, with boilers. And there's a couple of uh, case studies that we, that we looked at way, way back in the winter. This is the winter of 2010-2011. In, in the, the Mid-Atlantic area, Philly, Jersey Shore, and, and we're fortunate enough to have one of the contractors involved on the show today here, um, uh, Rich McGrath. Uh, two, two jobs that were done in the winter 2010-2011 in the Philadelphia, Jersey Shore area. Now, now Richard, please chime in if there's, um, uh, if the, to, to, to fill in the blanks, but I believe that winter, from what you guys have told me, that winter was somewhere between you know, 15 and 25 percent colder than the winter before in your area, than the winter 2009-2010. Now, we all remember the winter 2011-2012. Uh, that was the winter that never was. But in Philly, the winter 2010-2011 was, was harsher compared to the year before. One, one gentleman in Philadelphia replaced a fixed-speed circulator with a delta-T circulator. And that was the only change he made of any substance to the system. And what he found was in a, in a 15 to 20 percent colder winter, he used 15% less oil, okay, which is an attention getter. And 15% you know, less oil, if it's costing you 3,000 bucks a year in oil to heat your home, 15% is 450 bucks. That gets your attention, you know, a little bit more than 20 bucks that you're saving electricity. That's an attention getter. That, that's meaningful money. Now, Richard was Richard's uh, um, uh, system was in the Jersey Shore. And I don't know, is, uh, Mark, is it possible to unmute Richard and maybe he could tell the story better than I can? Well, you would have to because you're in control. All you have to oh. do is just um, click on his muted mic and then he can get. Oh, wait a minute. What did I do here? I did something goofy. A participants. Yeah, Richard, are you, uh, uh, yeah, can I do that for you? Let's, uh, let, me, uh, let me unmute you here. Then he has to unmute his own mic too. Oh, I'm trying to unmute you, man. I don't know how to do that. Unmute. I think I've unmuted you. If you unmute yourself, well, I can tell the story. Let me you try can figure out how to unmute yourself, man. <laughs> Richard, try talking. Oh, there he is. Hello, 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 hello. There he is. I did it. Hello. 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 I can't hear myself. Well, you don't need to hear yourself. You Good. just need to hear us. Good. <laughs> so what do you want to know? Tell me about Ingrid the, the, the apartment house. house. Ingrid yeah, the apartment house. house. Yeah, I went to a house with a with a very old well McLean boiler, and it had four gigantic circulators on there, and the house was cold. Uh, there's about 12 residences in the house, 12 apartments. So she wanted to fix that. She was using about $900 worth of oil a month for the past couple of months, and and in years prior. So we took out all four of those circulators. We put in 570 zone valves at that time centuries weren't available and we put in a 0013 VDT um, the next month it was on about six to eight degrees colder on average and her oil bill went from nine hundred dollars she consumed six hundred dollars in the first 30 days of operation of the system with with that pump and those zone valves um, as far as her electric I don't know how much that one it went down but uh, you can see she went from 900 bucks yeah, 30, monthly to 600 bucks. Say that again? $900 in oil the, the prior month, which was warmer, to $600. So in a colder month, her, 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 electric, her oil consumption went down by a third. Yes. And the key question, did her comfort factor go up? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Everybody quit complaining, and it was cold in certain parts of the area. The, the system was it's was horrible. We've been working on piping and such out on the delivery end since then, fixing stuff. Right now, she's undergoing a lot of piping changes, um, and and it's get, just getting better and better. 
her oil consumption is even down even farther now just because of change in the piping and such because it was just it was hideous what was there it had been plumberized eh? <laughs> we were uh, we were getting ready to do a real nice story on it. John Vastian was involved. He was actually in touch with her, but then some uh, some unfortunate event happened in March of eleven, I think, or twelve, and there was a fire started in a hotel right behind her, and it was six buildings consumed. And that boiler and that whole system is gone now, and there's now a system two thousand in the basement. Life <laughs> changing event. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rich. Anyway, I'm uncomfortable, so unmute me again. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Rich, for, for right, giving, Thanks, that Rich. First, giving that first-hand uh, story. So, well, that's that's kind of my, my presentation here, gang. So I'm hopeful that this wasn't too terribly boring. Um, no, you opened the door to a lot of questions, John. It may be interesting. Let's see, what do you guys got, man? Well, you know, I, I, I'd like to just speak from the perspective as a former instructor, and I know Yates is, and I think you probably have taught one or two courses, too, of the standard in the industry. And, and we all know that this 20 degrees is strictly a design function. Um, I have seen it one time in my illustrious career, and it was on a house that was brand new. It was all hot water baseboard. The contractor thought he was going to get his meter set the night before, so he turned off all the temporary construction heat. Well, we came into the house the following morning to meet with the meter set guys. The house was down to about 35 degrees. We were at design condition outside, fired up the system, and actually saw a 20-degree delta T. That's the only time I've ever seen a 20-degree delta T in the field, and it was obviously influenced by cold air, entering air temperatures into baseboard. Uh, flow rates, I'm sure, were probably well in excess of what they needed to be. So to look for a 20-degree delta T, as you said, is, is a... Uh, it's a hunt for something that probably doesn't ever exist. I've seen big delta T's on like radiant floors, but it was usually when they were doing yeah. uh, cold acceleration. It's a unicorn. It is. Yeah, it's, it, delta T's not a goal. It's interesting. Delta T's not a goal. It's not a target. It's not, in and of itself, it isn't anything other than what you design around. What the delta T is that you, that you look for is an important as, as, as it is trying to achieve it in terms of helping the boiler operate as efficiently as possible. We know heating systems will keep people warm with delta T's of five. But what, is that, but what does that do to the boiler, you know, to the thing that's actually creating the heat? It, it, it makes it, it short cycle. It's high limits. Yeah. So, so whether it's 20, I mean, we, the, the, the 20 degree design delta T was chosen decades ago simply because it made the math easy. Right, and uh, it's made, uh, and everything's basically rated on that as a result. So it's a, it's a good one to shoot for. Uh, but if you want to design to a thirty, go ahead. If you want to design to a forty, go ahead. European systems are designed to a forty degree delta T because they use little pipe. And why do they use little pipe? Because that was what was easiest to run back when they first started installing these things to keep the pump within reason. If they designed to a 20 degree delta T, they'd need a big old honking pump because that high of a flow rate through that small of a pipe, you get you get an immense amount of head. True, and and so thinking I, of it from the perspective of what you're doing to the actual element itself, and I don't care if it's baseboard or if it's a radiant floor or whatever it is, we've also also taught in school that the lower the delta T, the higher the average surface temperature across that whole emitter as a whole. So if you're using low temperature fluid, then keeping that delta T as low as possible is going to present your emitters with as hot a surface as possible based on the available fluid temperature. And, and in radiant floor, residential radiant tends to be designed around a 10 degree delta T for that reason and just to keep the floor surface temperatures you know, consistent. Right. So that's what I see as being an advantage to a low delta T. I can understand how it is that the boiler is going to bounce off of its high limits, but my thought process says to me, if I've got an existing boiler that's running, and all of a sudden I choke the flow going to the system, regardless of whether it's me using a ball valve or whether it's a DC CM circulator slowing its RPMs down to be able to achieve a delta T, immediately the boiler goes up to its high limit and starts doing the short cycle boogie again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I look at the potential of taking a system to a 40 degree delta T as the equivalent of leaving whatever you've got in there in the way of a pump right now and forget about the parasitic cost of operation but physically choking flow 
slowing flow so that you get a greater delta T is going to cause your heat source to peak out at its high limit quicker, which to me would create a short cycle condition. And again, this is just my brain thinking about things that I've done in the field just to see what would happen. You know, well, it, the same thing would happen at a small. And, the same thing would happen if you had more flow in a lower delta T, though, wouldn't it? It would. Yeah, but to so. me, if I had if I had more flow in a lower delta T, it would it, it would indicate to me a lack of load. In other words, there isn't anything there to be able to extract the heat right. off of the fluid that's being circulated through the system. Therefore, it should short cycle. And and uh, I, I I wrote back to uh, Kurt Alberstart. He mentioned some questions about sizing of boilers. And in my own house, I came up with 100,000 BTUs per hour, but I dropped a 50,000 boiler in there just to see what it would do. It's my house. It's my experiment. Yeah. If it fails, it's my fault, and I have to fix it. And uh, that's been in there for, well, since 2000 and since the year 2000. So it's been in for 14 years, and I have been well below design condition with that little 50,000 BTU an hour boiler, and it works just fine. Sure. I sized all my emitters based on calculated load but I put the heat source in at 50% less than what was supposed to have been done, and it works great. Mm -hmm. But again, back to the delta T, uh, delta T is a function of load. I mean, the colder it gets, the bigger the delta T I see in that system, and the warmer it gets outside, then the less delta T I see. Right. So by, you know, my, my, my brain's having trouble grasping the idea of slowing down the flow to achieve a higher degree delta T, I can see what the advantage would be from the standpoint of if the load's not there, then you can you can afford to slow it down. And I know Dave has personal experience with radiant floors in his house, and that's that's something that would always be a concern to me as a designer. You know, if I'm going to design a hydronic radiant heating system, we like to keep our loops plus or minus 10% from the longest to the shortest. This is stuff that you taught me when you were with Upanor and Wurzbo, mm -hmm. and have always stuck to that premises, but. You know, when I think about a situation where I've got every room as an individual load, I can't always guarantee that I'm going to have plus or minus 10% of my shortest and longest loops. So if I end up with one loop that's 100 foot long, and then I end up with a bunch of other loops that are 300 foot long, when I throw a delta T circulator at it, how is it going to guarantee that it's able to generate enough pressure differential to overcome the flow through that 300 foot circuit? And what is the flow, I mean, I know how to calculate it, but I've never really sat down to do it, but what is the return water temperature going to look at or look like where you've got a circuit that's 100 foot long that's obviously seeing more flow, less delta T, versus a 300 foot circuit that has less flow, more delta T, and when those two flows combine and come back together, you will have a calculatable delta T, but what's that going to do to the circulation? I mean, we've, I, we've I, always preached that you size the pump based on the total combined GPM demand, but the worst case pressure drop, which may not necessarily be the longest circuit. It could be a circuit right next to the boiler room that used 3H tube. It's going to work no differently than a fixed speed circulator or a delta P circulator. Because okay? it, 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 a delta P circulator is not going to, it, 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 it doesn't know, it knows, the, all the delta P, circ, all, well, fixed speed circulator knows one thing, it's on. Right. Yep. So, not. what's the flow going to be like in those two loops? That long loop and short loop, the longest loop and the shortest loop. What's the flow? What's going to happen in that instance? It's probably going to be overkill. Probably going to be overkill. But which one? If they're they're zoned separately, correct? Mm -hmm. Which one's going to satisfy first? Probably the shorter loop. The shorter loop, and then the longer loop's going to get circulation yeah. until it's until it's finished. Right. Right. Right, and chances are nobody in either room is going to notice. Well, that's what Dave's telling me. He said yeah. that he put the bumblebee into his house, and he's got radiant floors in there, and he said that he didn't see any difference in comfort no. at all. Because it's going it, to, it's, it's the, the, that's how a fixed speed pump's going to work. Delta T pump's going to work exactly the same way. It's not. It, it 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 cannot possibly look at the delta T of each individual zone. It's looking at the del the, the return water temperature from the system. Okay, so it's, it, as far as the system knows, it's on. Right? The overall system, system delta T. Yeah, it's the overall system delta T. It's not each individual zone. I mean, that's, that, that's you know, kind of impractical. It's the overall system, what's coming back from whatever it is you have the sensor on. Right? And then at that point, the shorter zone will satisfy first, and the last zone will satisfy later. Uh, delta P pump's going to do the exact same thing. 
You know, it's gonna it, it's gonna it's gonna circulate. It doesn't know that we have one short loop and one long loop. All it knows is pressure is all it knows is resistance against the impeller. It doesn't know that there's a short loop and there's a long loop. It just knows that there's resistance against the impeller. When both zones are open, it feels a certain amount of resistance against the impeller and it figures out what speed it's going to do. When one zone closes, that may be more resistance against the impeller and it's going to and it's going to slow down. If the short zone closes and the long zone still open, it may not feel any kind of difference in resistance. It may just continue running at the same speed it was running before. It really depends. Provided so the there, there's really no difference in operation, if that makes sense, and from, from, from where I'm sitting. I can't see that it's going to matter much. Hmm. It just goes against everything that we've been teaching for the last 30-some years, you know, of, of sizing circulators. And if, if we use a programmable delta T circulator, I guess the question is what actually happens in the system itself. I mean, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure I agree the, with that, Mark. I don't, I don't think it does. I think, you know, we've, we've been teaching GPM equals BQH divided by delta T times 500 for an awful long time. Right, but from the standpoint of sizing a pump, mm -hmm. a circulator, you know, we've yeah. always looked at the total combined flow and the and worst case pressure drop, and that's what you choose your circulator for. Bingo. How we, that's how you, how that's how you size a delta T circulator. But when I plug in the temperature differential, the flow is going to slow down, and the head's going to flow down, is it not? If you, it, it's going to what it's going to do. It's going to find its happy spot. Okay, like we showed earlier, if it, if we if, if let's say our calculations were spot on perfect and the, the, the required flow is seven gallons a minute at, at a 20 degree delta T, and the head is five feet ahead, that's where the pump's going to run. Regardless of the delta T or because no, of the delta T? No, because of the delta T. Because we designed, we designed seven gallons a minute. We, we determined that it was seven gallons a minute because we had a load of 70,000 BTUs. And the flow rate we need at 70, for 70,000 BTUs at a 20 degree delta T would be seven gallons a minute. Right. So that's where it's that's where it's going to find its happy spot. If we miscalculated somewhere, say if we calculated on the high side, well, it'll probably find its happy spot a little bit lower wherever it needs to be. But if we program a 40 degree delta T into that circulator, mm -hmm. the flow rate's going to be half of the yeah. flow rate that we would have had at. at um, yeah, ten thousand BTUs per gallon per minute. So yeah, but if but you'd only program it at a forty degree delta T if you had a reason to. Well, and that's the reason we did that with that job, Mark and John, and Dave, and everybody was we wanted to have the bumblebee run at its slowest speed, and the homeowners were quite willing to participate in an experiment with the baseboard hot water to see if that kind of slow speed was going to cause a temperature imbalance between the rooms and the zone. That was one of my concerns was, you know, you slow the flow down to a point where all, you know, a lot of the BTUs jump off in the first room and your water temperature in the baseboard cools down. Where are we going to have enough BTUs left to carry the load in the remainder of the rooms? And the interesting thing about that was that there was no temperature difference between the rooms at that lower, slower speed. Mm -hmm. So it worked very well. Yeah, because you, you, you had an interesting system that was, but where it was just, you said, you said it, was, it was very much over radiated, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Again, it all, it all depends on where you go from a design standpoint. If you can design to a 20 degree delta T, you can design to a 30, or you can design to a 40, whatever your purposes are. Um, you know, if you have an existing system that, that's, you know, a series loop into baseboard, you can pretty much bet that it was designed to a 20 degree delta T, have the thing run at a 20 degree delta T, and, 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 then, and then let it go from there. Well, I mean, the reality is that Manual J and all the other programs that we use for heat loss, heat gain calculations have a considerable amount of fat built into them. No, and really? that really yeah. came to light for us when we were doing geothermal work and found that our geothermal systems were able to handle 100% of the heating load without any of the electric resistance heat coming on, in spite of the fact that, according to my Manual J programs, they, they should have been running on electric heat at certain times, and they were not. So that was really kind of my first enlightenment into that. And then the, the ECM circulators uh, were the second enlightenment that I got with that in these low, slow flows where, in fact, comfort has actually gone up, not down, and we're not having problems room to room with temperature balance. So I think there's, there's a hell of a lot of fat in our industry from start to finish. And it, I think, you know, that is borne out by your presentation where 
you know, from your documentation, the pumps almost never, ever run where we, you know, where our design calculation showed they would be. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you do, I mean, in commercial buildings, when commercial applications, They'll, they'll specifically adjust the, 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 the power of the motor, and they'll trim the impeller to get the circulator to run as close to the, the, the duty point as possible because you're talking about you know, a 250-horsepower pump, and, and that's con that, the, different, the, the issues there can be considerable. In a little wet rotor circulator, like a 007 or a 1558 or whatever, it, it doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of difference. Um, and, you know, you know, we overpump in our business anyway with fixed speed circulators, and that's just kind of the way it is. What a Delta T pump is going to try to do is, it's, again, that, that what it, it, it's not something that I don't think needs to be overthought. It's just the, 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 the speed of the circulator will adjust to meet the needs of the system. And you got it, what you have is a, you have a, a, a sensor on the supply, sensing the hottest water going out to the system, and then a sensor on the common return, sensing the water temperature coming back from the system. All right. So let's say with the system that the pump's bopping along at a certain speed, okay, um, and the zone closes. What's that? That's a, that tells us we don't need as much heat out to the system, right? Right. Okay. All right. So what's that? The the almost the natural response of that return water temperature is going to be to do what? Rise. It's going to increase because we're not taking as many BTUs out of that flow. So the pump's going to say, you know, the pump's watching those two sensors, and it's going to say, huh, my return water temperature looks like it's starting to creep up. I better slow down so it won't. And that's really all it does. <laughs> then the zone opens. That's that, that we're taking more, we're taking more heat out of out of the out of the fluid, more energy out of the fluid. That return water temperature is going to want to start to drop, and the delta T is going to want to start to get wider. And the circulator says, huh, it's starting to get wider. I better speed up. And that's really all it does. It's interesting. Yeah, instead of trimming the impeller, you're trimming the power for consumption. More or less, yeah. That's a good way of putting it, Dave. Yeah. I'm going to have to uh, get my hands on one of these puppies and get it installed so that I can see it and experience it for myself because it just goes against everything that I was taught and that I've taught over the years. And But you know what? A lot of the things that I was taught, as we have been discussing here, like 20-degree delta T as an example, are wrong. Those are all basic engineering assumptions that in reality don't happen and are guaranteed to oversize the system for you and the last thing any engineer or contractor wants is that call of it's not comfortable in my house. Right. I, I think the thing to remember is delta T is not a goal. It's not a target. All right. It's 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 more like the scope on a rifle. The target is BTU delivery and comfort, right? Right. We want to deliver BTUs to the house. We want to deliver comfort to the people living in the house. Delta T is just one of the things that we have that is that helps us aim the rifle better. Okay, that, that, that might be the best way I can think of to, to, to say it. It helps. It helps you know get us to where we want to be uh, more effectively, more efficiently, and make the system happier as a result too. Kind of adding a laser spot to your. Uh little sighting system, huh? Yeah, there you go. That's a good way of looking at it, yeah. Because, again, again you know, Delta T is not a target. It really isn't. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a, uh, John Langan says it's a direction. You know, it's a, it's a GPS, so to speak, to help us get to where we want to be. It's a waypoint. Yeah. It's a sign, there's a signpost up ahead. You're about to enter the Delta T zone. Do not attempt to adjust your circulator speed. <laughs> it will do it on its own. <laughs> Sounds like the opening to a sci-fi flick. That's what you ought to call this thing, the hydro zone. Hydro zone. There you go. Do 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 do. Submit it. You got a little rod else you're going to You're going to be one of the people that get to uh, judge the contest and figure out what the final name is. I'll, I'll tell you right now. I think that one's the best. <laughs> <laughs> unbiased opinion. Everybody, a lot of time right now. Totally unbiased opinion. <laughs> Completely. No, I'd say it's totally biased, but what the hell. <laughs> I have a question for you. If I get into a situation, and, and we've all been in these situations where there's, especially if a person is, is uh, wanting to use the bumblebee, what if we have to put them in in parallel? In parallel? Yeah. As in like zone pumping? Mm, not necessarily zone pumping, but let's, let's say as an example, if we put it in parallel, we double our GPM. And we've determined mm -hmm. that we need twice as many GPM 
and it's a um, relatively low pressure drop system and we've decided that we need to put in two of these circulators. Now obviously they're going to have to have separate sensors, separate control objects, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, has anybody ever tried to install two of those circulators in parallel to see exactly what they would do? Not that I know of. I, I, I'll throw that to David. Maybe he knows. I, not that I would know of. I'm not sure that's a great application for a variable speed circulator anyway. But I don't know. That's a good question. I can't answer that, but that doesn't mean it hasn't been thought of. It just means no one's told me. <laughs> you know, my experience has been in the field with the engineers. And by engineer, I'm not talking about design engineer. I'm talking about operating engineers is that on the larger commercial buildings that we've had the experience to uh, be able to go in and set some um, controllers that would basically vary the speed of the pump, um, these guys must be chicken like me. The last thing they want to get is a call from the residents, and, and most mm -hmm. of these were old senior housing projects. Uh, the last thing they wanted to get was a complaint from the residents that they weren't warm. And so they leave the thing turned up to 100% of capacity, and it's like, no, 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 no. That's, that's not what you want to do. And they, you know, they'd originally called out a specification for pressure center differentials so that you could basically fine-tune that pump and keep it operating at a certain point instead of just letting it do whatever it was going to do. Mm -hmm. And these guys just run scared, and they're like, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to leave it turned up to 100%. And I finally convinced one of them to work for a large Catholic housing organization. I said, turn it down to 50% and see how many complaints you get. If you get no complaints, then leave it alone. But if you really want to fine-tune it, for energy conservation, turn it down just a little bit until you get complaints, and then turn it back up just a little bit. <laughs> there you go. I, I, our commercial department would probably be able to answer your better question, answer your question better than I could, Mark, on that one. Um, yeah. And we have very, we have a, a pretty extensive line of variable flow circulators on our commercial end. Um, but you know, I've got my hands full on with residential stuff, so I'm, that's kind of not my department. But they would definitely be able to answer your question better. And, I, and again, I don't know if Dave Holdorf's got uh, anything to add on that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you're looking at a lot of projects like that that are going to have three-way bypass valves. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't worked on some of the larger ones. I've been uh, working with more of the Meridian line, uh, which is, it starts off at an inch and a half size and, and being variable speed. And it, uh, you know, yeah, the guys get a little jittery about, hey, I just want this thing to run full bore. And... Uh, you know, and I, and I work with the design engineers, and then I see the, the contractors installing it. And, yeah, the operational engineers are the ones that always want to run it faster, you know, because they don't want the phone call because they're hanging out on the job site. Um, you know, what they have found, you know, by doing these things is, you know, we're starting to eliminate other components in the projects now um, because of the overflow where they're trying to get some efficiency in the system. And now the, the balancing valves can... You know, they, they put these balancing valves in the system on all the different loops, and they're choking them down to their 20, 25% open now. Um, but the pump is still running 100%. So, you know, it, it's starting to uh, starting to think differently. But, yeah, they, got, they, they can easily override them and put them in full speed. That's good to know. Um, what do you guys think about Reynolds numbers? I mean, that's one of the other things that kind of concerns me about significantly reducing the flow and, I've looked at the numbers before, and I've also looked at baseboard, and have seen laminar flow with too low of a flow. Um, so that's that's, I guess it would really have to be calculated to be able to be able to address it. But it just is another one of those things that, like the Europeans, yes, they do go with a lower flow rate, but they've also got TRVs and other things to basically create turbulence that uh, is going to get a better scrub action of that fluid against the inside working surface itself, and I, I just, I, I, I'm leery. I'm old school, I guess you could well, say. Just pay attention to the lowest, to the low speed on the, on the circulator. As long as that's above our minimum flow rate for air you see that? Yeah, you see that, you see that, 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 the uh, air, uh, yeah, my, my screen's still up, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's also why there's a minimum speed built into the circulators. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about, the minimum speed. Right. We don't get down to nothing. There's still going to be some flow, and, and you know, like John was showing, we end up with over-pumping in a lot of applications because yeah. we're not going to be hitting that low end. Uh, uh, yeah. Really, once you, get, once you get around, you know, 50% load in most cases, you're not going to have a 20-degree delta T. You're going to have something less because that's as slow as the speed the pump is going to go. 
So as it gets warmer out, you will see the delta T get smaller simply because of that, that minimum speed. Got it. Well, I'm looking forward to getting my first installation done so that I can wrap my hands around a pipe and squeeze hard and go, ooh, ah, man, that thing is hot. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, it's, I, again, I always encourage people, it, it, in, in situations, in, in most situations, it's, you know, it, it, it's just a pump. You know, in, 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 in one, re one respect, we're just moving fluid. We're trying to move it as accurately as possible. There's nothing really different about the sizing or the selection of it that's going to be different from any other residential circulator. If you're picking a fixed speed pump or anything else, it, it, it's, it's, it, the selection of it is exactly the same. There's nothing that you really have to take into account. Just make sure that your maximum speed is your maximum requirement fits with underneath line two somewhere. Um, and that's going to, kind of all you all you really need to know. Uh, setting the the sensors, the supply sensor goes where the water going out to your system is the hottest, and the return sensor is uh, on the common return. So it's sensing the common common return uh, temperature. Okay. Here's a technical question for you, and it's it's kind of a carryover from uh, the good old days of when we were installing pressure activated bypass valves. Mm -hmm. And um, I think basically that came as a matter of, I think Robert Bean said it's like driving with one foot on the brake and the other foot on the gas. Uh, most, yeah, in most cases, bypass valves are simply band-aids for self-inflicted wounds. Right. If you hadn't oversized the circulator in the first place, you would not need that bypass valve. But Or, or if you've used a steep curve pump with zone valves and you have banging zone valves, that's the wrong pump for the job, too. That's right. another thing to consider. But, you know, on Friday night at 5 o'clock, whatever you've got that fits between the flanges that's on your truck is the right pump. So I still, guys, what kind of what kind of pumps you putting in? Keep that pump on the truck. That's right. And and if a little pump does a little good, a lot of pump will do a lot of good, right? <laughs> One would think. <laughs> um, I know with the Delta P circulators that they absolutely tell you do not put pressure activated bypass onto the system because if you do, you're going to create a hole that the pump's going to see, and it's just going to run at its maximum RPMs all the time. Mm -hmm. What if a person were to install a different to Kate engineers. The engineers have been doing it this way forever, and they won't change until mm -hmm. somebody tells them there's no reason to do that. So if they're specking circulators, Bumblebee is an example, with a pressure-activated bypass, good, bad, don't need it, get rid of it? I would want to I, I know why they were doing it. Uh, if they're only doing it because they think they have to, well, uh, I, I'm kind of exploring because I'm... I'm Question I've never been asked, and I'm trying to think about. I, I'm still trying to think why you would do it, but that's not the question you asked. I would think if it's temperature, and Dave, you chime in too, because Dave's, Dave's the engineer of the two of us. He's the smart guy. Um, I would think it wouldn't matter. Um, yeah, no, actually, I would say it, it would affect the system. Um, yeah. Because it's going to slow the pump down, where we could get uncomfortable out in the out in the house itself. Uh, we're not going to be able to satisfy it because we're not going to get enough flow. So okay, because if, if I got you, if one of the zones is closed or a couple of zones are closed, if any flow is going through that bypass valve, it might trick the the sensor into thinking the temperature is higher. Yeah, it's going to blend the return. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. My my answer to that would be yes. Still install them. Just close them. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as the engineer leaves the building. As soon as the engineer leaves the building, just crank that sucker down tight. There you go. <laughs> or cut it out and take it to the next job. Yeah. <laughs> well, John, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. We do have some questions that your yes, cohort thanks, in crime, Mr. Holder, is answering online, but I'm not sure that. Everybody is aware of the fact that they can ask questions and get answers to it. So I'm going to slide up to the top of these questions here. Can you see them on your screen, John? Uh, let's see. I can see a couple here. I got the, just from Har Harvey. Is that the only one, or are there others? No, there's others below him. Oh, I, 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 my last one was from, uh, uh, let's see. My last, the last one I see here is from, is from Harvey. But should I turn the desktop back to you, or does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. You can hang on to it if you want. Okay. I can take it from you anytime I want. <laughs> <laughs> now, the last one on my screen was from Carl Parsons. Let me go back up to the top of the screen here, and we'll 
shoot them out there so that in case people didn't realize that there was that potential that they could actually see the responses that were coming back that uh, we can get some good answers to them. Uh, let's see, hopefully that issue got resolved. Rich McGrath said that he had people from the neighborhood wanting to know how to sign in, wanted to know if they needed to be an RPA member, and the answer is no. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, had a, I got a couple of emails this morning that people were having some trouble logging in, and I tried to help them as much as I could, but I'm not sure how well that worked. Probably a loose nut behind my keyboard. Mm. And let's see, um, oh, Rich also said that Amazing that you guys are the leaders of this industry by listening to these stories. You haven't heard anything, Rich. You should, you should listen to us in a face-to-face -face conversation. This is the clean word. Stories, but yeah, writing storage tanks downstairs and destroying people's houses and things that contractors do in general. By the way, John, did, did you used to work for Rich Tithui? I worked for Rich Tithui for about a year, yes. Richard's going to be on our radio show. I would like you to be here so that you can harass him. I would never dream of harassing him. Richard, Richard, I owe an awful lot to Richard. He did an awful lot to get me started in this business, and uh, he, is, uh, he is a true friend, and uh, I, appreciate just, I appreciate everything he's, he's done for me. I wouldn't be here today without him. Well, me as well, but it would be nice to have somebody here to keep him in check. <laughs> yeah, if we were going to do a roast, that would be fun. <laughs> and, it, and it could turn into a roast. You never know. <laughs> All uh, right, questions. See. What do we got? Comes one. Let's see. Um, Kurt Abishart was talking about sizing of boilers and said, "Side note: This is why I keep. This is why I work to keep the minimum firing rate on modulating equipment at one third or less of the design day heat loss." Right. In other words, what he's saying is downsize your equipment yep. based on what you see in a way of theoretical load. And I think a lot of, in fact, I know as a matter of fact, one of our guests that came on the other day was talking to us about load calculation programs. And there isn't really a good program out there that takes into consideration the internal flywheel mass effect of the house itself. Mm -hmm. And most of them, unless it's an air conditioning program, don't take into consideration the internal loads and the internal gains. Mm -hmm. And in reality, in the real world, um, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. I mean, like 65 degrees, speaking of busting, busting myth, 65 degrees is that theoretical point where your house is at a point of neutrality. It's neither gaining heat or losing heat. Well, depending on the internal gains, that may be as low as, in my case, in Denver, it's 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. My house can go down to 40 degrees Fahrenheit before I start seeing a correlating drop of temperature on the inside to the point where I actually have to start my boiler. So I have my warm weather shut down set for 50 degrees just to give myself a little bit of buffer. But... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Doing the numbers, as John has always preached, and then being comfortable and saying, you know what, I'm going to make this a little bit less than what it looks like there because there's a lot of internal gains that I didn't take into consideration that are going to happen whether I want them to or not will result in longer run times, which equates to greater efficiency. Um, let's see. You guys ever read the Energy Vanguard blog? Oh, yeah. No. Yeah, you know, Allison Bales, what a great guy. Uh, yeah, that's just a great blog. blog. He wrote one. I shared it. I shared it in the RPA room on LinkedIn yesterday. Just about you know, are we respecting the numbers? You know, or or are we using the numbers responsibly? I think that's what he said. Using the math responsibly. And it is important to understand that the math is important, but understand what the math is actually saying, and where it comes from. Figures don't lie, but liars don't figure. Yep. That's right. That's right. I know we had a, a tell a story in class about the, the 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 Massachusetts rule of thumb for heat loss calculations. The other guys in class say, "I don't want to know all this. Just give me a rule of thumb. I don't want to know all this. Just give me a rule of thumb." I said, "The biggest rule of thumb I can tell you is do the frickin' math." Okay, that's the best rule of thumb there is. Um, but the, the the old rule of thumb is if you can picture Interstate 90 in your head, you know, the Mass Turnpike goes from Boston to Stockbridge and then on to Seattle, basically. Um, you know, people in Seattle think it starts in Seattle and ends in Boston, but they're wrong. Um, the theory was that if the house is built north of Interstate 90, you figure 30 BTUs per square foot. If it's south of Interstate 90, you figure 20 BTUs per square foot, which means who the hell laid out the, inter the, the inter Interstate 90? Was it civil engineers or was it the National Weather Bureau? Yeah. It was the weather bureau. It would have to have been, you know. If you, if, you buy, if you buy that theory, if you buy that rule of thumb, you have to believe 
the civil engineer said, wait a minute, before we start turning dirt, let's check with the weather people. Because we if we do this right, we could save heating contractors for generations to come a crap load of work. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. A short, so, short trip for a return call for doing an improper job of sizing. Hey, you guys want to hear something a little scary? It's almost Halloween. Shoot. Yeah, I went to a Rheem dealer's meeting yesterday, and Rheem now has a program that uses Zillow that you can click on, you, you punch in the address and the zip code, and it tells you the B2 heat loss and heat gain of the house. I've seen that. And they that were it, recommending that we as contractors use this program and then size our equipment to the program and forget about doing manual J. Yeah, it's just Seriously. based on... on they they look up square footage in in the dat in the construction database, right? And also the age of the home, and then they you know they use these rules of thumb that you're mm -hmm. talking about <laughs> to gauge what kind of insulation, glass exposure, and you know directions to the north, south, east, and west, and they throw a number out the door. If they use that much information, it's not bad. But <laughs> you guys, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, sir, did you do a manual J? No, I I did a manual Z. Zillow. Yeah. Oh, I, I yeah, I did it manually. Way. I manually multiplied the square footage by 30. Yeah. yeah. That was a manual me. No, I just I bit my lip and, and behaved myself. I didn't act up in class. Oh, you should have you should have acted out. Here's a question for you. Will using delta T improve the efficiency of modcon boilers by reducing the return temps? It can help a little bit. It depend it, it can help anywhere from a little bit to a to a to a nice bit. It kind of depends on how that boiler is piped. Because if you have just the, the branch header with the, the closely spaced T's and a, and a small header, um, probably not as much as, as it would if, as if, we, were, if we had a, a, a buffer tank and, and some mass to the thing. And if we had some mass to the thing in a buffer tank, we could, again, we could be satisfying calls for heat without ever firing the boiler based on the temperature in the, in the tank. By, you know, we're just taking out the BTUs we need, et cetera, et cetera. Then, if we if the control strategy is set up to to control the, the boiler controls the temperature in the tank and the zoning controls the flow out of the tank to the zones, then we, then we can make that boiler work really efficiently. Okay, he added to his question and said using triangle tube for an example, which is a fire tube down fired boiler with quite a bit of water mass in there. So yeah. uh, the more ma the more mass, the better. Yeah, I think I think it, it'll help. It'll be a It'll be a better solution than a fixed speed pump, most certainly, but not on the not as the boiler pump. Are they? They're not talking about a boiler pump, are they? No, I think they're talking system pump. Yeah, as a system pump, yeah, you wouldn't use a variable speed pump on a boiler pump. As a boiler pump, you could though. It only has to be. La 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 la. Has to be married into the firing rate. La 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 la. We can't say that. Oh yes, you could. No, the boiler people. The boiler people. The boiler people have make that make that call. Yeah, right. Some of the boiler people are making that call. I know that they are making that call. I know Triangle's working on that. Yeah, they're, they're looking for like a zero to ten uh, input. Lock and uh, already got it. Cir circulator, yeah, yeah. So that's something we've been working. We've had a zero to ten variable speed circulator for years. Rich McGrath says there's too much fudge in heat loss calculations. Really, Rich? Come on. It's a wonder we're not all diabetic. There's so much fudge in heat loss calculations. <laughs> See, you get that joke. I've been using that joke for years. Most guys look at me like I'm a nut, but yet you get it. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I'm pre-diabetic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fudge is off my list. There you go. From John Cataneo, are the Bumblebee Cirque sized and named consistently with the Double Lot Series pumps? Ah, it's Johnny Cataneo. Giovanni. No. Uh, there's just one Bumblebee, the, the HEC2. Uh, and that's just the, the 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 pump that we showed you. We have um, we also have a, a double O VDT circulator. Uh, the double O series pumps, any of the double O series pumps from a double O three up to a double O fourteen, can be ordered as a double O VDT variable speed delta T. It's a regular permanent split capacitor motor variable speed, but we put a vo normal normal permanent split capacitor motor but we put a variable speed delta T controller on the back of it. So it is now, in a sense, a delta T variable speed circulator. It's not, it's not as electrically efficient as, a, as an ECM type of circulator, but it uses less electricity than a fixed speed circulator. 
uh, and you can get any double order any double O series pump up uh, in in that mode. The stock models um, double O eight double O Dave double O eight double O twelve double O thirteen right? Uh, that is correct. Yeah. yeah. So those are the stock models, but any one of them can be ordered up. But as far as the ECM Bumblebee, it's just a one-size Bumblebee at this time. Uh, in the coming year, you might see some, you'll see some changes and some, some additions. Um, so are there any new Bumblebee babies potentially on the drawing board that will be bubbling to the surface? That is a very good question, Mark, and uh, I will look into that and get back to you at, your, at my earliest convenience. Thank you. <laughs> Universal answer. It depends. It depends. That's 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 my spin doctor response. I've been watching the news, you know. Yeah, let's see. Harvey's got another question here. It says, how about delta T Cirx on low mass radiant with a tight ODR, say sixty four degrees Fahrenheit ambient outside ambient? Okay. Yeah, sure. What would the, I guess what's the spe specifically what would what what is he asking about them? I mean there's no reason why there would be there's no reason why it wouldn't work very, very nicely. Well, his follow-up question is, or on a high mass radiant, for that matter. Just to, to, again, it's just working on delta T, and what what temperature the water what temperature is the water coming back? I, I guess the, uh, uh, Harvey, if you have a little bit more specificity, unless I'm missing something, I'm very, very well maybe missing something. But I think low mass radiant, it, it, high, high mass radiant, uh, out, outdoor reset, fixed temperature. It only cares about the difference in water temperature between what's going out and what's coming back. So I don't. I think in a high mass system, like uh, say it's a concrete slab, when the system's starting up, all right, you're sending out, you know, some, you know, say you're sending out 120 degree water to the slab, but the water's really, really cold coming back. What's the pump going to do? Increase. It's going to go. It's going to go full speed till it hits its till it finds its 20 degree delta T. All right. So it's just like putting in a fixed speed pump or anything else, you know. Uh, and that, at that point, and same thing with a you know with a low mass radiant system, it just uh, it'll just react to changes in return water temperature uh, appropriately. Again, I, I'm not sure I'm getting the full depth of the question. I hope, did that answer your question, Harvey? If not, um, help me out because I'm not. Sometimes I don't I don't get questions and I'm not too bright. I don't know. You're not too bright. That's why your father called your son. <laughs> no, no, that's not what he called me. <laughs> He was, I think he was one of the first people to actually advocate DNA testing. <laughs> I told you he was related to the postman. Yeah, he says, I don't know who your, who your father is, but any, I, this is actually after he watched me try to pour, pack and pour a lead joint for the first time. Actually, no, actually, he's actually tried to watch, he watched me try to pack and pour a lead joint for the 27th time. That's when he started walking, his, walking away, shaking his head. Horizontal with the running rope? Oh, God, we're really giving away our age now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Or inverted with a, a running rope. There you yeah. go. Oh yeah. So, Dad, can't we use no hub? No, damn it, you're gonna get it right. <laughs> no hub. What's no hub? Yeah. <laughs> well, can we go about PVC, Dad? Shut up, boy. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm working my way down to the questions here. What is the minimum rated temperature of the circulator? Can we use them on the source side of the heat pump down to 25 degrees Fahrenheit? That's from James Shank, who was one of our previous. Interviewees, good question, James. That's a, um, down to twenty-five degrees. I don't believe so on this iteration. Dave, you have do you have the spec sheet on on at the tip of your at, at fingertips? Because I don't, I don't know about that. Uh, future generations, you may see that will uh, that can be set to work with chilled water. If that's what he's asking, I'm not sure what the uh, what the minimum temperature range is. I'd have to look that up. Yeah, if it's, um, if it's operating in the delta T mode, I can't remember off the top of my head what is the low end. Um, never really talked about it, but if we would actually use that, say, in the set points, I know the minimum is 65 degrees at a read. Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah, I would have to look into that only because I, w I would be afraid if below 65, deg uh, below 65 degree reading does it only put 65 into the software. So, right. I'd have to look into that. Yeah. And, and just for those that don't know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking a little bit differently here in this question, thinking, you know, are we looking at the water temperature or are we looking just at ambient temperature? Will it work outside? 
Um, I'm not sure on that. No, he's talking water temperature. James Shank has a significant background in uh, ground source heat pump. Got mm -hmm. Okay. And one of the yeah, I, I, on the, on the, so you're talking about on the heat, so on the, on the, the, the heat pump side. side, not the, not the delivery side. On the source side. Not the yeah. Delivery side. Yeah. Right. I, I, that I don't know. Uh, I, I can't answer that because that's just, I don't know. I would suggest you look into it to find out for sure because I can see where there would be some great potential applications for it. Um, James Shea. If I could, can I throw something at you though, Mark? Just a couple of other uh, kind of interesting functions of, of the the Delta T pump is that it has the the Delta T is adjustable from anywhere to five to fifty, uh -huh. so you can adjust it to whatever you want to set it at for whatever application is is it, it best it's best suited for. Uh, the other thing is that it has two other functions. Uh, you can set it up as a, as a fixed speed pump it could be it could be a four speed pump it could be so you could select one of four fixed speeds if you wanted to for a specific application okay. um, so that makes it one better than a three speed pump yeah. and <laughs> the other op uh, app, uh, function it has is it can work as a set point pump where you only use one sensor now in a, in a fixed speed in a fixed speed mode one of four fixed speeds you don't use any sensors in a set point mode, you just use one sensor, the supply sensor, and you can set, put that sensor in anything, and, and the pump will try to vary its speed to maintain a particular temperature in something. Um, most common use is in an, is, is, uh, the sensor is placed in the airstream of a fan coil, and you set it for, say, I don't know, 120 degrees or something like that, and the pump will speed up and slow down to try to maintain that temperature in the, in the, in the airstream. So it's just another function. It's it's not very commonly used, but it's one of those little hidden secrets that if you you poke around and say, "Hey, that's kind of neat. I might need to use that someday." Yeah. No, I can hey, use John. Apps. Hmm. Yo, are you put are you putting that in the air or are you strapping it onto the return side of that coil? Uh, that can be put anywhere you want it to. Really, I, I'm just the, 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 the that example was in the airstream. If you wanted to maintain it to specific temperature in the airstream, if you wanted to maintain a temperature on the coil, you could put it on the coil. So as your supply fluid temperature dropped based on whatever outdoor reset or whatever, then the pump RPMs would increase trying to maintain a given discharge temperature at the fan coil unit itself then. So if you set it for, like, say, 110 degrees and you had 180 degree Fahrenheit water going through the system, then the pump would slow down because it's no problem to hit that discharge temperature, whereas if the boiler is running at, say, 90 degrees, then the pump is going to increase the RPMs trying to satisfy that, which would give you a higher average temperature differential across the coil. Makes In the words of Sheldon sense. Cooper, bazinga. Makes sense. <laughs> um, the, the reason that James Schenk is asking these questions, as I stated, he's into the ground source heat pump systems, but he also made a presentation for us a while back about these new multi-source storage systems. And it's basically a 2,500-gallon tank, and they're using a water source heat pump to draw that tank down. And when the water goes from 32 degree Fahrenheit water and turns into 32 degree Fahrenheit solid ice, it adds 143 BTUs per pound of whatever water you've got in that tank. The the heat of of uh, phase change and going from water to ice, and I see it as a huge potential in this industry. I mean, these these guys are taking common houses out in Wyoming and turning them into net zero projects without having to pump R60 into the walls and R120 into the ceilings and everything else. They're just using site-derived energy. Today, as an example, here in Heaney, if it gets up to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, that air temperature is enough energy to be able to recharge that 32 degree Fahrenheit tank. If the solar collectors are sitting outside, as soon as they see sunshine, then they're going to be able to pump heat into this big block of ice. And they raise the temperature of that storage tank anywhere within its reasonable withstanding capacities, but typically not more than about 40, 50, 60 degrees because it's not insulated. They've actually got the tank in earth contact absorbing that energy that's coming from the ground into the tank. And one of the biggest problems that I've seen of the industry that pertains to ground source heat pump is that they have absolutely no control over their field circulators or loop circulators. Those things are running wide out regardless of whether they're at 10% of load or 100% of load. 
Mm -hmm. And that parasitic cost of operation is chewing into the potential savings of these systems. So using a circulator that is variable speed based on delta T makes all the sense in the world. If the load's not there, then you don't need the RPMs to be able to push a whole lot of fluid to that system. So I just well, did a little uh, digging, and I found a, uh, a minimum fluid temperature uh, operation for the CERC to be 40 degrees Fahrenheit. 40 degrees, uh, okay. So yeah, they yeah. are worried about dew point, which is understandable. Yeah, and I, and I would think just the electronics. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Sorry. I was going to say probably about the electronics and any condensation, things like that, that we have. And we don't, there's, there's no design dweep holes to collect that condensation. Um, so I can see that but, being a challenge. But I could see an enterprising pump company developing some sort of a delta T circulator that might work in a geo application. Just, just, just saying. I could, I could imagine that happening. I could imagine you probably know somebody that could do that. Uh, I, I, they're in my Rolodex. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I, uh, Harvey, uh, Harvey kind of elucidated a little bit on his his um, question. The ODR might require only 75 degree water. 10 degree delta T would result in a lower than room design return water temperature. Could this result in under pumping? I, I, perhaps, but again, remember, Harvey, there's that low, there's that minimum speed uh, in the pump. So e even though we may be running at a 10 degree delta T and everything's running fine when we're under higher loads, under low load conditions. Remember, when we get when we hit that minimum speed, which is nine wa nine watts of consumption, that's as low as she goes. So when we get into those mi those milder and milder conditions, it's again I, it, when we're when we hit minimum speed, that it doesn't go any slower than that. So I I, I think uh, that's a okay, thank you for clarifying. I think that might be where you're going with this, Harvey. Let me know if that answers your question or not. We had a, another comment, too, from Carl Parsons. This is in regards to rule of thumb. He's changed it. It's now called rule of finger. <laughs> Which finger? I listened to his explanation. <laughs> I thought boilers were sized by the horizontal finger test. Stand across the street with arm extended and palm, palm facing you. Open <laughs> and close your fingers until the house is obscured. Multiply the number of fingers by twenty-five or 30,000, depending upon the brand of boiler, <laughs> the system. And, and, you know, that, that's a new one on me because I was always taught to use your fingers vertically and you stand ah. across the street and however many fingers it takes to completely cover the house is the number of sections that are required for the boiler. Well, that's probably because you, you're dealing mostly with ranch houses, Mark. He might be dealing more with, you know, Victorians. Two stories. That's true. I hadn't taken that into consideration. Good thought. See, there's, there's, a, there's science to this buckaroo. You know, that's, you know and I, actually I think that that vertical finger application is what they call the Long Island method. Oh, no, wait, that's cover every wall with baseboard. That's right. Right. And, and and my Uncle Frank had a great method for sizing boilers. How and it, it, it never, ever failed him. It was, it was the, the spatial differential method. Spatial differential. Right. What he would do is when he had to size a boiler, um, you know, my Uncle Frank was a great heating man. He could install the butt off of anything, man. He was, he, his, his work was gorgeous. He just wasn't much into, into the math part. My dad did the math part, but, you know, my uncle was just a, a magician with, a, with, with tools. Um, but when he wanted to size a boiler, he used the spatial differential method, which, which involved using his folding ruler. To the day he died, he never used a tape measure. He thought they were communist. He would take out his folding ruler, and he'd measure the door that the boiler had to go through. And then he put a little pencil mark, usually right around the 32, 33 inch line, fold it back up, go to the supply house, go to the counter, unfold the ruler and said, I need a boiler a little narrower than that. What do you got? <laughs> Spatial it. differential. Got it. Spatial differential method. Man worked every time. He'd be in trouble with these new wall hung boilers because they yeah. don't take that much <laughs> You have to put two of them. <laughs> yep. And if one does a little good, two will do a lot of good. Yeah. All right. Well. I'm taking back over the control of this program because I have a slide that I have to show, unfortunately. This is um, a requirement of our lawyers. Oops, that's Dave's program. That's not the one I wanted. And that's James and Collins' show. That's not what I wanted. Well, anyway, it's the disclosure that basically thank you to Takeo Corporation and John and Dave for coming in and speaking to us about this, that these um, products are not endorsed and we do not guarantee that any of the drawings that Mr. Baba showed to be accurate 
or correct. And uh, as usual, everybody has to use caution in deciding what product they want to use. Um, I think Taco is a great family. They've got uh, a lot of really good products available. I would strongly recommend that you join John's Neighborhood, which I'm even going to join John's Neighborhood here one of these days, too, when I can find some time in my spare schedule and uh, basically become a member of the Taco family. A lot of really good educational opportunities available from these folks, and um, they're in it for the industry. They um, are not self-centered. We started a new organization within the RPA called the Hydronics Industry Alliance Commercial, and uh, we have all of the big dog pump companies are becoming members, and there's nothing more refreshing than to see the head of sales for Taco and the head of sales for Bell and & Gossett and the head of sales for Grunfoss all sitting in the same room agreeing that we need to do something to stop this loss, this backsliding of the percentage that we currently own in the way of commercial markets. And uh, Taco was spearhead of a lot of this and brought not only pump manufacturers but hydronic component manufacturers in general to the table. And this thing is starting to catch traction, and we've actually placed our first round of ads in the uh, Boma magazine, and our goal is basically to get the attention of those people that are basically making the decisions on what kind of systems go into these buildings and prove to them that hydronics has been around for 100 years and that we are, without a doubt, the most efficient and that, by golly, they need to jump on board for us. So with that, it is basically 2 o'clock in the afternoon out there on the East Coast, and it's noon here in Heaney, Colorado. I would like to uh, thank John Barba, Dave Holdorf, and um, Dave Yates in downtown York, Pennsylvania, for all of your time and information. And um, be sure to check in with us in two weeks when uh, we become live again. And let's see. If I can find the right slide, I can tell you who it is that's going to be coming in with us the next time. Hold on. The Swing Green Team will be our next group. I uh, ran into these folks while we were at the Comfort Tech Show down in Nashville, Tennessee. They have a drain waste heat recovery system, which I actually have installed in my house. I used to have it in Denver, and then I moved it from the drain in Denver to the boiler exhaust, so I had a super modulating condensing boiler. And after running it there for three years, I took it off, brought it up here to my mountain home, and it's recovering roughly 50% of the energy that typically goes out of the drain and plugs it right back into the beginning of the system again. So a very reasonably cost product, excellent idea, and um, something that really needs to be promoted. So without further to say or further to do, thank you all very much for attending this session of Boiler Talk, this will be archived. As soon as I get the information back on the archive, I will send the information out to the uh, typical websites, uh, All Hands Heating Help website. Um, after Swing Green, we have Ray Wolfarth coming on. After Ray Wolfarth, we have Bob Roar coming on, Hot Rod Roar. And uh, then we will not be having a show for the turkey break. Dave and I are going to take a break and see if we can gain about 5 or 10 pounds each. And... Um, <laughs> Oh, yeah, why wait? We have, if, yeah, if we why have, wait? <laughs> I need mean, to why practice. Wait. If anybody has any suggestions as it pertains to the name, be sure and send them to me. And if anybody has any suggestions of somebody else that should be coming onto the show as an interviewee, send them to me, and we'll be glad to get them hooked up. But as it looks like right now, we're getting booked clear into January. We've got Mr. Hollihan scheduled and uh, also Rich Chithui and his boys, and um, folks from Grunfoss. We've got all kinds of people lining up to come onto the show. So thank you all very much. Have yourself a wonderful weekend, what's left of it, and uh, we will talk to you in two weeks. Woo! Thank you very much. Hey, thank thanks, you. guys. See you later. Thank you. Ciao.